sights to show you. Hell yeah. <laughs> Welcome to uh, the Horse Syndicate Discourse. And uh, I want to thank each and every one of you who support the channel by subscribing and liking and all that good stuff. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. We're going to do something a little bit different. We were going to do Red State, but I've had a really, really rough day uh, because of the cold, too. It's freaking like negative three degrees, I think, today. I was just looking at it. Uh, it's zero right now. Excuse me. It's zero. It's much warmer. And... Um, my car battery died, and I've been dealing with that all day long, and I and it hasn't been resolved yet. So hopefully tomorrow, because I have to work on Tuesday. Anyway, tonight we're going to do something different. We were going to do, like I said, Red State, but instead we're going to, uh, because I didn't get a chance to watch Red State, uh, I've been very busy. We're going to talk about uh, movies that made Nate, uh, and we're going to do each and every one of us, myself, Seth, and Jared, uh, at some point. Probably not all in a row. In a row? Uh, but we're going to kind of dig in and try to figure out what movies make Nate tick. So uh, I'll bring in Seth first and then Nate. Seth is watching football, I'm guessing. How high is your TV? It looks like you're looking at the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's uh, it's, it's mounted up there pretty high. The Lions or Rams? Which one? What's that? Who do you want to win, Lions or Rams? Uh, I'm rooting for the Lions. Okay, I just, I just thought you watched the Buffalo Bills. I didn't realize you watched the rest. Um, are you prepared for uh, an episode all about the movies that made you who you are? Can you can you think of any offhand? Other than Die Hard. Because I feel like they're all going to be sequels. Can you repeat the question? My computer kind of froze up a little bit. Can you think of any of the movies that that you could say made you? Because you'll be, I think you're up next after this, after Nate's. Oh yeah, I, there's there's quite a bit I can choose. All sequels? <laughs> Believe it or not, no, they're not all sequels. Okay. Sequel Seth, ladies and gentlemen. Sequel Seth. All right. Uh, let's, yeah. let's dig into Nate. Nate, how you doing? Not dig into you, but you know. Uh, I'm doing yeah. as, as good as I can be, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Nate had a, had a weekend too. Uh, <laughs> if you, I don't know. Did you share that on the internet? No, I didn't share it online, but yeah, I was in a really bad car accident. I'm probably lucky to be here right now. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. The, the picture you sent, I was like, holy shit, how'd you survive that? <laughs> Japanese engineering. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Were you the only one driving in the car? Yeah, thank God. I was the only one. It was, you know, on the way home from work. Damn. Well, we're glad that we're glad you're here and not somewhere else. Um, so let's uh let's kind of break it down for everybody uh in this episode. What exactly you're wanting to do here and well, we had talked about doing a show where you you pitch something about like doing an episode where we get to know the discourse hosts mm -hmm. and we never did that. And then uh, when William Friedkin died, I came across uh, Joe Dante's podcast. I think it's called the, the films that made us or some type of movies that made us. And Joe Dante and his, his co-host, instead of talking about William Friedkin's movies, they asked William Freakin, what were the movies that made you? Like, what are the movies that you grew up on or what made you want to be a filmmaker or had an effect on your life? And that's, it was really interesting to hear people talk about that because, you know, we all talk about horror movies, but nobody just watches horror films. We've all been molded by so many things. And uh, I thought that was a good way to get to know somebody. Plus, they might, you may be surprised at choices. Like, I can't wait to hear what you guys throw at us and i thought it'd be interesting to kind of go it's not really like your favorite movies it's, it's it, i mean it is but it isn't i the way i broke it down was like thinking back to certain periods of my life and what movies i was watching a lot at that time and what had a significant mark like molded it like 
what my idea of movies are or what I was watching a lot as as a five year old or what I was watching. So I kind of broke it up in years. Like, so the first one is like from like my first five years. Like mm. Movies I probably watched in those early, 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 early years uh, a lot. It's not necessarily what came out in those years, but what I was watching and what I remember having a big impact on me or even something like my whole family watched a lot, the whole family watched. Uh, so that's kind of did. I don't know how we're going to do it. It's just something, you know, we were going to do red state, as you said. And I was like, well, I kind of, I could miss tonight or, you know, Hey, I, I kind of had a shitty <laughs> 36 <laughs> hours, maybe just like hang out and shoot the shit. Um, and then I thought, well, wait, wait, we got that episode we talked about because we did talk about doing this yeah. months ago. And I had made a list back then. And I'm like, I think I still have my list on my phone. So I said, how about this? So uh, it's just a fun way to talk about movies. And, you know, you guys could throw in your, I mean, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of overlapping movies that are on my list. Are probably I, You know, I think I was, think, I was thinking about it a little bit. I think you might be surprised by some of mine, especially uh, in my teenage years into, uh, early adulthood because there's some movies that i don't like we all kind of know each other and like i said with seth i know die hard's got to be something in there for him and i know he's a huge uh superhero fan and and sequels and all that stuff but i bet there's some weird things like he'll say uh, my science project or you know something kind yeah, of I mean, that's a good movie <laughs> yeah. you know that should but, be one of mine yeah right i love that movie growing up but you know and i think there's a couple that <clears throat> Because I like, so it's funny you did this because last night I came across that list that you did a couple years ago. Uh, favorite movie from each year you've been alive since you, you were born. Yeah. And I put mine up again and I had to add four years to it because this was from 2019. And I'm looking through, I was like, oh man, I missed some of these movies. <laughs> you know, I love these movies. And, yeah. and uh, like my favorites from uh, 1998, 1999, 2000, I don't think you guys. I think you might be surprised because yeah, we're we're close in age, but we're not. And yeah, we're, you you two are probably closer in age than I am. I guess. Well, you were right? well, you were seventy six. Seventy six. Eighty, and he's eighty three. Yeah, so I mean, we're we're all you're kind of in yeah. the middle of between me and Seth, and then Jared's. Yeah. I'm what, the middle child. Well, Jared's about your age, or what? he's eighty one. I think eighty one. So yeah, y'all right. really, really close. So we're all close, yeah. but there's also differences. So, and I found that you know there's probably going to be movies that Seth just loves that. You know, didn't mean as much to me because there is that seven, eight year difference or whatever. Yeah, like and, Superman and, four. <laughs> um, so I guess I guess I hear bullshit all the time. I can jump right into it, but we won't spend like too much time on them. But because I do have a, I you know, I tried to whittle it down. Okay. Um, but yeah, this is like all right. We'll just start. This is like <laughs> whittling down from four hundred fifty movies to yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this is. The first five years, 1976 to 1981. Um, so, of course, Star Wars, probably the biggest impact of my life because I was born the year before they came out, uh, the first one. Uh, so I grew up, by the time Jedi came out, which is my picture on the show, I'm wearing a Return of the Jedi shirt. It's probably My third birthday, by the way. <laughs> I was seven. And... So that's a pretty good span of like from, from one to seven of seeing these movies. Mm. Uh, and then of course, watch them again and again and again. Um, you know, some of my fondest memories are getting, you know, the, the star Wars toys and seeing the movies and having the lightsaber and the Han Solo's blaster. I was going to say that was my favorite thing. That was Han yeah. Solo's blaster. Yeah. yeah. There's a picture of me holding the blaster, come mm. taking on a door around that time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Star Wars, uh, definite. Um, I won't spend too much time on it. Everyone, not everyone has seen Star Wars, not everyone loves Star Wars, but um, George Lucas and his trilogy had a significant effect on who I am, uh, my love of stories and adventure and heroes and villains. And I mean, just seeing Darth Vader walk on screen, uh, you know, that's a bad guy. You know, when he walks out on that star cruiser and when Luke Skywalker, I mean, what a great hero for a kid and, and the, the, the droids and, you know, it just it had so much everything. Um, next up, Seth is wearing it. Superman one and two. Uh, 
those were my, I mean, I grew up with superheroes, but Christopher Reeve, th those came out. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of me wearing, I even almost had a picture of me with the, with the Christopher Reeve Superman shirt on when I was about three or so. Now, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you have a preference of uh, one or two? And do you prefer the Donner cut or the original cut? I probably two. watched two a lot more as a kid yeah. uh, because the first one came out when I was two. Mm. Um, and the second one came out when I was four or five, I guess. I probably would have saw it. I think I, I may have seen it in the theater. My first Halloween was 1980. I went to Superman. I've got pictures of that. Um, and my, what do they call them? The, the underwear? That, like the, 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 I can't remember what they call it. Underoos? Um, underoos, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my grandma always talked about, you never saw me without my Superman cape on. Yeah. Like, running around in it. Um, so yeah, but the part two, I just yeah, the part two is definitely the one that is cemented with me. Just the whole, you know, Zod and and the fight scene in downtown Metropolis at the end. I mean, it was just epic. There was a, and there was a certain, yeah, I love that movie. I don't watch it enough. Like I watched it a shit ton in the eighties, but uh, yeah, Superman two. As far as the Donner cut, I've only seen the Donner cut once, and I think I mentioned this in the group. I've seen the original movies so much, you know, that it's hard for me to watch something different than that. Cause you know, it's so much. So when you watch something that's changed, it's kind of like watching dream warriors without, cause I grew up watching it from the, the, the cable version. So like when you hear mm -hmm. the, uh, into the fire opening with the yeah. docket song, it's like, this doesn't feel right. I'm used to that, uh, quiet, cool music. And even though docking was the original theatrical one. So even though, it's, you know, I, I still miss the quite cool music when I watch Dream Warriors because that's what I knew. So yeah. anything different, it just, you know, it could even be better. But it's like, but this is what I know by heart and this is what I love, you know. And so it's like watching the special editions of Star Wars. I still don't love them because it's like I saw those other movies the way they were. That's why fr Star Wars fans are so frustrated because – you just fall in love with what that was. And it's like, don't fuck with that. Or let me at least have that, you know, still so I can see it the way I fell in love with it. Uh, but moving along, uh, this isn't a movie of that era, but the wizard of Oz, it was just a staple. In the that was one of those that we watched. Like we had, it, for, I don't And I, I feel like it was a, may have been a thing for people, but it, we always, I think it was Thanksgiving or the day before Thanksgiving, we would always watch Wizard of Oz. So it was a staple in my house, too. Yeah, I mean, it was just uh, it's one of those, again, early magical movies that was timeless. Mm. Ho hopefully people continue to see The Wizard of Oz. Um, and, and then another, uh, musicals. You know, we talk about musicals, but um, Grease was a big, big deal in my, my house. Uh, we watched that all the time. My parents loved it. My little sister loved Grease. Uh, so watched that movie a whole lot. Um, so, yeah, I, I just I had to throw that on there. Another one is Mary Poppins. Probably throw it in that same area with Wizard of Oz. My mom loved Mary Poppins. It was from her childhood. So we watched Mary Poppins a lot. And, you know, just a fun, creative fantasy movie. Um, now we get into the early eighties fantasy movies like that, that are not as big as star Wars, but I remember seeing a lot, watch them constantly know them by heart. Don't watch them enough now, but I, I, sh if I go back, I'll, they'll put a smile on my face. I should go back and watch them, uh, more now, but first off is clash of the Titans. Mm. When so, was that? Was that 81? Like 80, 81. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't see that until I was in my 20s. Really? I, yeah. I, I, I missed I out on that. It. I watched it all through childhood and all through yeah. the 80s. It was like, you know, if I wasn't watching Star Wars or Superman, I was probably watching Clash of the Titans. Uh, you know, just again, just heroic storytelling. Ray Harryhausen, Medusa, the Kraken. Uh, Harry Hamlin. I, Harry Hamlin. I had the action figures. I mean, it, it had everything. It had scary had moments. Action figures for that too. Yeah, I have. I actually still have. Uh, I have uh, Perseus and I have uh, Commodus or whatever the bad guy. Uh, I forget his name. Um, 
Yeah, like I, I'd love to have the Kraken. I never got the Kraken. A guy that has a toy shop locally has the Kraken, but he won't sell it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the Class of the Titans movie uh, was something I watched a uh, shitload. Uh, and then another one around that same time awesome. was Flash Gordon. Watch mm-hmm. Flash Gordon all the time. Um, it had scary moments, had exciting moments. I, I, I vividly remember like the hand putting in the hand and the thing and the oh, mm-hmm. whatever. And then the uh, the fight on the spikes with the spikes coming up out of the ground, the, the revolving, rotating, rotating with the James Bond. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Timothy Dalton. Um, so yeah, I I loved Flash Gordon. You get the great Kiss or not Kiss a uh, Queen soundtrack and. Max von Sydow is mean. Uh, yeah, uh, Flash Gordon was one that I watched tons of times. Um, next up, another one in that vein, and in the vein of all these, uh, Dragon Slayer. Uh, see, all these, I, these, these all kind of escaped me. Really? I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't see any of these movies when I was younger. I, I had to wait till I was older. I don't know why. Maybe they weren't oh, on the cable. They, they came out. They came out around the time you were just really in diapers. <laughs> so I was sure. kind of, I guess, I think Dragon Slayer was like 81, maybe 81, 82. So I was about to, I was starting school, my like grade school. So uh, yeah, Dragon Slayer was a big one for me. It was a scary movie. You know, you had little baby dragons eating a girl. And it, it just, uh, the dragon looked amazing, you know. It was a big time for fantasy movies in the early 80s. Um, Excalibur came out also. Excalibur. I, w- I didn't really watch Excalibur a lot, and I didn't watch Conan the Barbarian back then, probably because it was R-rated, and they probably didn't let me. I mean, he flat out kind of rapes women in that. But. Yeah, but I Dragon Slayer, Clash of the Titans, and then this one, uh, probably my first Wes Craven movie, Swamp Thing. Watched oh, Swamp yeah. Thing all the time. It was always on. Um so yeah, Swamp Thing was uh, the, the to, to round out my first five years. Swamp Thing was one I watched a ton. Um, you know, a lot of these movies do or should have been R rated. I mean, Clash of Titans, Swamp Thing. Now I have nudity. Yeah, I was going to say Adrian Barbeau is <laughs> topless in Swamp Thing, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think it's PG. Yeah, there's well, definitely nudity in uh, in uh, Conan. That's for sure. Yeah, and Clash of Titans. There's, there's some nudity in that. Is there? Um, yeah, pretty sure. Um, <laughs> So, all right, moving on to the next. What's the next area? area? Six years to ten years, so 1982 to 1986, which is probably kind of our strongest area, I think, from the time we're like grades, like through grade school, basically. Yeah, you're inching closer to where you got into horror too. Yeah. So, first off, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I I love that movie. It's one of my top ten favorite films. Um, watched it all the time. Out of all the J- Indiana Jones movies, I know a lot of people have an affinity for Last Crusade, but I was already a teenager when that came out, and it just didn't have the impact that Raiders had. Temple Doom was a big deal when it came out because I was eight. I had the lunchbox, you know, but I for some reason I didn't go back to that one as much. But I watch Raiders of Lost Ark constantly. Seth, what's your favorite Indiana Jones movie? Because mine is definitely Last Crusade. Yeah. Last Crusade? I think that was in response to me saying Seth. Okay. What's my what? Favorite Indiana Jones movie? Temple of Doom. Oh. There we go. The Trinity. Hey, Jimmy. How's it going? Um... No, oh, Alex. Yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I just uh, one of the greatest action films ever made. One of the greatest action characters. Mm-hmm. It's just it's Spielberg again. Spielberg Lucas. They were just everything for a kid that age, that time. Uh, which brings me to the next one. E.T. Saw E.T. in the theaters. I did too, actually. Loved it. Had the toys identified with the kids you know it's just it et was like this just magical film it was like this movie that was on another level and i think part of that's because of how it wasn't available you know it did come to 
VHS for like seven years or something. I don't know really? why. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't hit. You couldn't rent it. Like I saw it in theaters, and I don't know if I saw it on cable or what, but it was a movie that I didn't get to see a lot, and I would have owned. But like, yeah, it didn't. I don't think. I think it took like seven years before. It didn't it stay in the theater for an extra long time? Because I, I, yeah. I, I know I've see, I saw it in the theater. I was two when it came out. Yeah, I think I know they re-released it. Yeah, I think might they be kept it. it out, and I think they re-released it. Back then, I mean, movies would stay in a theater for a year or two. This is know, uh, early popular. VHS, too, you know? Yeah. Um, Holy shit. E.T. made almost $800 million. Oh, That's it's huge. Um, next up was Red Dawn. Ah, yeah. Awesome movie. Watched Red Dawn constantly. My family loved it. Uh, yeah. I think we've talked about that on here before. Um, you know, it was a scary movie, but it was like, I don't know. I just, I, I just loved it. I still love it. Um, John Milius, you know, didn't watch Conan, but I watched that one. He did Conan. <laughs> um, and next up is the breakfast club. Uh, John Hughes, but that I, I, all the John Hughes movies. Uh, there are two on my list right here. Real fast. They were released at ET in 1985. So that's probably why okay. I got to see the theater. Yeah. Sorry. I had yeah. to know. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, so The Breakfast Club was a big deal. Oh, yeah. I watched it a lot. Is that your favorite of the Hughes movies? Yeah, that's my favorite. And that's why I'm, I married my wife. We met in a chat room called The Breakfast Club uh, in... Really? Yeah, 2001. Yeah, we... Oh, Seth's oh, gone. Um, yeah, we, I, my brother-in-law asked me what chat rooms were, and I thought they were stupid, and I didn't like them. And I said, well, I'll show you, and I did, and... Back then, they were just, you know, had different names, and mm -hmm. one was called The Breakfast Club. I was about to sign off, and I clicked on it, and there were two people in it, and one of them was my wife. And wow. We chatted for, like, five hours. That's and then I cool, asked yeah. for her email, yeah. So I asked uh, for her email. <laughs> yeah, because back then, like, you didn't, right, like, right. it wasn't like Facebook or something. Like, if I don't, like, how do I contact her again? It's just a yeah. chat room, you know, unless we say, hey, meet me back here at this time. Right, yeah. Um, this is again, 2001. Um, so yeah, breakfast club, still one of my favorites, um, favorite John Hughes movie. Is the, have you shown your daughter that yet? Yeah. And she loved it. She's oh, a big yeah. fan of that one. Yeah. Uh, it's just one. It's just going to, it doesn't matter. That's one you have to pass it. down. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Next one is like class of the Titans, Dragon Slayer and all that is the beast master. I missed that one too. Yeah. <laughs> That I, I remember I mean, it, but I missed it. Most people from my generation have seen that movie more times than they would admit. It's it, it, it's 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 like, I mean, it's Don uh, Coscarelli, and when I met him, you know, he wanted to give me a gift because I gave him the uh, cover for Horror Hound magazine that I did, yeah. my Phantasm yeah. cover, and he said, "Let me give you something." And there was stuff on his table, and I he had the Blu-ray for Beastmaster, and I didn't have the Blu-ray, so. He gave me that and signed it. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, Beastmaster is a movie that I just worshipped and watched all the time. I, like I said, I think it was a uh, there's that saying that it was always on HBO. So HBO stands for Hey Beastmasters on. <laughs> I never heard that. <laughs> you never heard that? <laughs> no, but I remember it being on all the time. It was always yes, on. <laughs> and I remember like just imitating him. I had like a wiffle ball bat. And I'd be doing that, you know, thing he would do. And I remember uh, my uncle who's about he was about 12 years older than me and his girlfriend he came i was at my grandparents and i was in the backyard with my wiffle ball bat doing the Beastmaster sword stuff and she knew what it was she goes oh the beast master yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was cool she knew what i was doing uh brings up another one uh the karate kid oh yeah uh i took taekwondo because of that movie i'm sure a lot of people took martial arts of some type um but yeah i watched the karate kid constantly Again, took martial arts after seeing it. Um, then I stopped uh, Taekwondo. I think I got to like a green belt or a blue belt. Uh, but a kid down the street dropped a cinder block on my foot. Damn. And I couldn't go practice and I just never went back. Um, the break of wish... foot? No, it knocked my toenail off. <laughs> that was it. But That uh, might be more painful. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. But... Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had stayed with it because martial arts is really cool. It's discipline, it keeps you in shape, 
be able to defend yourself. And re- part of it also was because we had moved to a, a, a kind of a rougher neighborhood. Uh, my dad got laid off and uh, I was getting in fights and I wanted to learn to defend myself. So also took it for that reason. Um, all right. Next up, huge movie, Ghostbusters. Saw it in theaters. Loved it. Had had the T-shirt. Remember, mm-hmm. me- remember the smell. I remember how it smelled because <laughs> because of the iron-on transfer, I guess. Or, mm-hmm. uh, it's funny. I, I think of that. Oh, I remember the smell of the T-shirt and the logo. <laughs> the smell uh, to it. Um, but yeah, Ghostbusters saw it in theaters. Ghostbusters loved it. Everything back then. Yeah. Yeah, love, yeah, man. Yeah, watched it all the time. Especially when the cartoon came. Did you watch the cartoon? I didn't really watch the cartoon. Oh, I loved it. Um, I had to get all the toys. I even had a proton pack, like a little blue plastic I don't, proton. I don't pack. remember having any toys for Ghostbusters, though. I I don't know if I had anything from that movie toy wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the sequel came out when I was thirteen. I went and saw that with my uncle. Um, I'll never I, forget the hype of 1989 that summer. Ghostbusters, Batman, Indiana Jones. Come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> um, so next up, 1985, Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. Huge. We grew up in the best decade of all time. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. It was a great movie. You saw it in theaters. I mean, Michael J. Fox. I loved Family Ties. I loved him. still love him. Miss him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he was always great. Loved Doc Hollywood. Loved Spin City. He Did was you just... ever watch uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yeah. Did you he see showed up on that, didn't he? Oh my God! Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and he used his uh, disease as a joke in that, and yeah. it was perfect. Yeah. yeah, it was great seeing him back too. Yeah, I love that guy and, and mm-hmm. Marty McFly. And I mean, just the relationship they had. The uh, best thing Zemeckis ever made. Which there is another Zemeckis movie on my list, which is next. Which is Romancing the Stone. I loved Romancing the Stone. Talk about fun adventure movies. Oh, yeah. All the time. Watched it constantly. I, I preferred The Jewel of the Nile a little bit more, but they're both really great. Yeah, I remember seeing Jewel of the Nile. I didn't see Romancing the Stone in theaters, but I did see Jewel of the Nile because we were such a big fan of Romancing mm-hmm. the Stone. But God, I had the biggest crush on Kathleen Turner in that movie. Like, that was maybe her. Another movie that should be on the list is. is it's funny thinking about these women because they are so sexy. Like Kathleen Turner and Romance of the Sun was so sexy. The other is Jessica Lange and King Kong. Mm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Early, early, like, whoa. Yeah. Um, she never stopped looking good. Oh, no. If I'm being honest. <laughs> um, next up is a movie that's not as popular. It's one of those movies where I watched it. My family loved it. We watched it constantly. Um, and when I grew up, I found out like not a lot of people didn't like it or didn't even know what it was. Uh, and that's Streets of Fire. Um, Walter Hill movie, Michael Prey, Diane Lane, another hottie. Um, Willem Dafoe, Bill Paxton, Amy Madigan, Rick, Mor- uh, Rick Moranis. Just a great like action rock and roll movie uh i just love that movie i think it's one of it's one of my very favorite movies that has like really shitty reviews and most people don't th- love it but the people who do really love it yeah to this day i've never seen that one yeah that's 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 a, a, a personal guilty pleasure movie um next is a movie i saw in the drive-in uh Wee's big adventure mm. i uh the uh, the special that he did on stage, Pee Wee's Playhouse or whatever it was called, or the Pee Wee Herman Show, I think it was called. It was on HBO. So I learned, I saw Pee Wee on HBO, his stage show, him and Phil Hartman and all though. And uh, so when the movie came out, we had to go see it. And you know, introduction to Tim Burton and Danny Elfman as a composer, and you know, I, I just adore that movie. That's a that's a happy movie. You put that movie on, I'm gonna have fun. To this day. Um, next up, another John Hughes movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Loved it. Still love it. Can watch yeah. it anytime. I have a good story about that one. Um, let's hear it. So I was uh, really sick one day, and my mom said it's the saddest she'd ever seen me. So she went down the street to the video shop, rented that, and it made me laugh while I had chicken box. Oh. I was wearing a chicken, yeah. 
And so it made me laugh and I got to forget about the chicken pox because of that. And for that, that that's always like, there's like always these movies that are like comfort movies and Ferris yeah. Bueller's the one of those ones, no matter how bad I feel, it makes me feel better, yeah. especially because of Jeannie. I love, <laughs> I love, I love her. And then yeah. the stuff with Charlie, she, I just love that movie. I, I'm, a, I'm right there with you. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, did you hear like Charlie Sheen like really like stayed up for three days straight to look like he did? Look like movie. it. Yeah, <laughs> jeez, <laughs> I've never seen somebody's eyes so red before and so sunken in. You know. Yeah, uh, I think there I was another. Was I think there was another actor they wanted and they did. They didn't think it was big enough part, you know. And but mm. Charlie did it. Um, and they had worked together on Red Dawn. Um, yeah, so they knew each other. Um. Let's see. Next up, I know this is one you guys like. I watched it a lot. Guilty Pleasure movie, Commando. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I had a big crush on Alyssa Milano, but uh, that movie's just fucking fun. It's just My favorite ridiculous. Arnold movie. It's so ridiculous. But yeah. Great, great. Just all around great. Well, you know it's going to be ridiculous. He starts off the movie carrying, carrying a, a tree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely my favorite Arnold movie. Yeah, that's, I know that's, Terminator's that's, great and everything, but I love Commando. Commando, I love. He takes Terminator. a fucking saw and throws it at some guy, and it goes, it's, it's it, <laughs> you know, skins his head basically. You're, you're so. right. Like I love the Terminator, but if if you said, hey, you want to watch Terminator or Commando? Like, let's watch Commando. Hell yeah, <laughs> Commando's it's fun. just fun. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Love Beverly Hills Cop. Eddie Murphy yeah. was everything first in the 80s. Great, yeah. And like, yeah, the first two movies, but especially that first one. It was kind of like my first rated R movie where I'm hearing <laughs> fuck, fuck, motherfucker. All that. Like, I, I was not used to hearing that language. And I think that was the movie where my, like, when I watched, they let me watch Beverly Hills Cop because, I mean, we probably rented it in 85. I was, what, nine? So, you know, I'm watching this and you can basically hear every curse word in the book. In Beverly Hills Cop. Right. So it was after that. I think my parents were like, he can handle rated R movies. Um, but we had that recorded on videotape. I watched it all the time. That I had a videotape with Bre Beverly Hills Cop Command. I think maybe no one was a commando. Beverly Hills Cop Brewster's Millions, which I mm. love. It's not on my list, but I love Brewster's Million. That's another movie that a lot of people don't talk about or think about. But Richard Pryor, John Candy. I watched that movie all the time. Walter Hill movie. They got made Streets of Fire. Um, I can't remember what the third one was, but it was, yeah, Beverly Hills Cop, Bruce's Millions, whatever the other one. I watched those three movies all the time. Um, next up, my favorite animated movie of all time, The Secret of Nim. I don't know Never if that's that a movie that may, may, means anything to you guys. Never seen uh, it. Great movie. I recommend you got check. If, if that's playing anywhere, show that to your kids. It's a really great movie. Really good story. Uh, it's about the, this mouse lives on this farm. This whole community of mice and rats, they live on this farm. And Mrs. Frins, Frins, forget her fucking name. <laughs> uh, anyway, she's got, she's, her, her husband died and she's on her own and she lives in this, in this rose bush on a farm and the farmer's going to do the harvest. So, they're all in danger of their lot, their, their houses. They're having to move. The whole community's having to move because he's going to harvest. And so it's like, oh, like the end of the world's coming. We got to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and she's got a little boy who's sick. So she can't move him. So she needs help. So she, they, they say, you need to go to the rats because the rats are the intelligence ones. They were all in like a, they were part of a, NIM was like a science project, like a, Te lab testing rats to, and they became smarter so they, they're like they're elevated or uh, evolved intelligent uh, having evolved intelligence so she has to journey to talk to the rats to get them to help her move her home safely to protect her family and it's this adventure that she goes on it's fucking great beautiful movie 2d oh, animation I, I highly recommend you show your kids that one uh it's just a really great movie um next up big deal for my family uh top gun this is the last one on this period top gun my dad was in the uh, air national guard when that came out not the navy but you know the air force mm -hmm. but he was still obsessed with air like jets and pilots and all that and so we he we went to see that he took us to see it and we just all loved it just 
it was so cool. Um, yeah, I, I bet. Um, so yeah, there, 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 there's the uh, six to ten. Like I said, I won't spend too much time on it, but yeah, Top Gun was a big deal. I had the, you know, the pilot jacket, the leather with the patches and everything, all that. I got my hair cut like Maverick. I started mm-hmm. getting the flat tops or whatever the haircut that he had. Um, okay, so now we're getting into teen, preteen, teen years. So I broke this up from 11 to 16, 1987 to 1992. Okay, first on this list is, of course, the first four Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Uh, stayed up and watched part two and three, the night that Dream Warriors debuted on cable. Fell in love with them. Dream Master was in the theater at that time. My dad took me and my friend to see it. That night we rented the original movie, and I watched those movies constantly. Uh, became made me, made me a horror fan. Uh, of course, a big Freddy fan. Uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to work on projects for those movies as far as T-shirts and books and action figures and things. So, uh, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street, of course, is an obvious movie that impacted my life and molded it. And um, those first four movies are very, very, very special to me. Um, I don't have a a dislike at all <laughs> those first four movies like people want to say oh that one sucked that's like no they're all wonderful for me um next would be uh, halloween four that halloween four came out in 88 when i was getting into horror it was i don't think it was my first michael myers movie i think part two mm-hmm. was my first michael myers that, movie. that mine too actually i was gonna say that was probably the best year to get into horror 1988 yeah <laughs> i mean yeah, come was, on <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was 12, so it was, you know, right right age, and I was getting bullied, and I was kind of looking for that that thing that was mine kind of mm. thing. A lot of people weren't into horror. Uh, Halloween 4, I, I'm, you know, I guess maybe I identified with Danielle because we were about the same age. I think she's maybe a year younger than I am. Uh, but I just, I don't know, I love Halloween 4. Um this one is not of that era, but because I was getting into horror, I started watching horror movies and, uh, you know, the exorcist, um, was a movie that scared the shit out of me. That, that was the first horror movie I came across where I lost sleep. It's the only movie that I've ever lost sleep. It's the movie that terrified me. It's the movie that I can't watch casually, still can't watch it casually because it's, I can't watch it casually, creepy. but. Never had that effect on me, and I'm embarrassed by the one that made me, gave me nightmares. So, you ever seen Terror Vision? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all had those. Those. There's all, there's all kinds. Of, like yeah. some of these movies I've mentioned scared me as a kid, yeah. but like The Exorcist is the one that just, and probably because of the buildup. I think I've told the story of how like I was at a neighbor's house, and we were going through the VHS tape that his dad mom had and they had the exorcist and it was still in the plastic and we're like why is it still in the plastic and he said my mom wouldn't let dad open that she was mad that he had it in the house and she said he can't open it and so i was like what the fuck is this movie you know i think i brought up to my mom and she's like oh that movie's horrifying uh really really scary so i think it had been built up yeah and you know when i watched it and still it's it is a scary movie for a 12 year old kid who's New to horror. Uh, I mean, I saw Poltergeist and the Twilight Zone movie. I was those were some of the early horror movies I saw. But uh, The Exorcist was the movie like, holy shit, just really scarred me. Um, but I love it. And as, as an adult, as a filmmaker, it's just so inspirational. Again, this whole podcast is because I was watching the thing on William Freakin. And so William Freakin's the man. Mm-hmm. All right, here's one of obsessed die hard love die hard watched it all the time my family loved die hard we watched all of them after we saw the first one we saw all the other ones in the in the theater you know the excitement of going to see die hard 2 i remember you know to see the next one um we rented die hard and while we were watching a friend of my mom's told told me it was it was this was it was real (laughs) i was was nine years old i'm like this is really happening like, yeah, they just recorded everything. I'm like, oh my god. 
It's such a great movie, you know, and it was it was kind of unexpected because we watched Moonlighting. So mm. I knew Bruce Willis from Moonlighting. We loved that. My whole family a lot watched it all the time. And I think he did Blind Date the year before. Yeah, and Blind Date was fun. And that was a fun movie. So I'm like, that guy, like, because I'm so used to Stallone and Schwarzenegger at this point that I'm like, no, that guy is a badass? No, no. And, like, he was so perfect. It was like, and he was like, what, their 10th choice or something? Yeah, and that, <laughs> so, changed, that changed action movies. Too. Oh, it did. Like, that yeah. It changed everything. I think I brought up on the show, like, Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone blamed Batman for changing or get, killing the action movie that he was known for. Mm -hmm. I'm like, fuck, no, it was Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, in my yep. opinion. Those movies change. Oh, yeah. Hand in hand. Action. Definitely. Lethal Weapon's also on the list. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, Lethal Weapon was a movie that. Two Christmas yeah, movies. Yeah, both like back to back, 87, yep. 88. Uh, that was. I had seen Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome when at the theater drive in with Pee Wee Herm, the Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So, I that was my introduction to Mel Gibson was Thunderdome. But I didn't recognize him from that, you know, when I saw Martin Riggs. Um, but Lethal Weapon was just huge. I to the point where I was dressing like Riggs, mm. you know, like I would wear just like I didn't have the mullet, but I had the, oh, know, I the, did. the flannel and the jacket and all that, the layers, and, you know, walk around with your badge. And you, I, you know, I bought a toy Beretta when they looked like guns and you mm. had the clip, and you know, it was so cool. And then, of course, fucking McLean had a, a Beretta too. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, Lethal Weapon, Die Hard were huge for me. And then the next one, we've done a whole episode on Predator. Uh, significant memories for me, seeing that the first time. I won't go on. That's into my it. favorite movie from 1987, according to my list. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 87, the fucking Lethal uh, Predator, still in the top 10. Die Hard and, and Predator are both in my top 10 of all time. Um, Terminator 2. Big significant movie. I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I think I think it was my sophomore year. Yeah, uh, you didn't get any bigger than fucking Terminator Two. It was I remember epic. watching that. I, I, that movie was so amazing. I was like, was the first one this good? And going back and watching the first one again, and then I, I'll never forget because we rented it. I had to wait till to rent it because we didn't go to the movies very often. I was more of a when it came on cable or H or uh, renting, and so I had both Terminator and Terminator Two. So I watched Terminator Two. Went out and rented Terminator, watched Terminator, and I'm like, wait, which one's better? So I watched Terminator 2 again. Like, I watched both of them like three times that whole weekend. It was awesome. Yeah. it's a, I still don't have an answer, by the way. They're just, yeah, I, I, it's hard to choose because they're just so different. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just Terminator 2 is, it's kind of like saying Alien or Aliens. Like, I like Alien more, but Aliens is, it's, it's they're kind of the same because. One's like this contained kind of horror movie, and the other is this epic-sized, action-packed movie. Mm -hmm. um, and t you know, Terminator Two was just like we had not seen anything like that because CGI. Well, James Cameron did both Terminator Two and Aliens. And... Yeah, and, and like CGI was just really starting to become like he he, he kind of tested the waters literally in the abyss, and that was like whoa. Yeah. Uh, you know, Willow had its little thing, which is okay. And then The Last Starfighter, another movie I should probably have on my list earlier. Don't forget about Alien 3. That has great CGI. But, no. <laughs> but fucking T2, when, you know, you see Robert Patrick's Terminator, and mm. that shit still holds up, too. You watch it. It's not like, oh, that looks bad. And that movie's 33 years great. old, and yeah. it still looks better than some movies. Oh, yeah. Like The Flash that came out last year. The <laughs> yeah. TV, it's, I'm, I... I don't want to dog on that movie, but like the CG in T2 is way better than the flash and they're 32 years apart. Yeah. And it's also minimal, you know, but it, it's, um, yeah. It's definitely not returning. His connection sucks tonight. Okay. So I, we can just tell. comment when you want, buddy. Yeah. Um, yeah. T2 was an epic film. Um, mm -hmm. and here's one I got to see in the theaters. My mom won tickets on the radio. It was a sneak preview before it went wide. The Monster Squad. Oh. And I may be one of the few people who saw that one in the theater. Yeah, I did. Uh, I love the Monster Squad. I mean, I was a big I, Goonies is probably another movie that should be on my list. That would be on mine. Um, I loved Goonies. Saw that in theaters. Was obsessed with it. Uh, the, but the Monster Squad, you know, it was 
Monster Squad may be what really started to move me towards being a horror fan because it came out the year before I saw Nightmare on the Street the movies. And I remember starting a monster club, uh, you know, and I had like the monster, the classic monsters horror was for me. Like I, when I've talked about it, you know, in the eighties and the seventies, when it was hot October, it was all about Dracula and Frankenstein's monster and the mummy and all that wolf man. Um, and, you know, I had the Rimco action figures of the monsters when mm-hmm. I was a kid. Um, so Monster Squad was just perfect. It was just, it, it had a, it had this great mix. It it was a kid movie, but it had, it handled the monsters right. They were scary. They were, you know, a threat. And uh, I just, I dug that movie a lot. Still do. See, I mean, it's kind of a. It's one of those guilty pleasure movies that people didn't realize a whole generation grew up on. Um, but I, I was there at the beginning when that came out and, uh, before it hit wide. Uh, all right, here's one that was, I think Tarantino said they invented a new language when this movie came out. And it was, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was just like this movie, you're on this ride, and you're like, what is this? Sh- what is this? It's hilarious. It's great. Raising Arizona. <laughs> I'll never forget seeing that movie the first time. Every time I watch it, I love it. It's, it was my first Coen Brothers movie. Uh, you know, I didn't see Blood Simple till years later. But uh, Raising Arizona was like, holy shit. Like, just from the music to the dialogue to the pacing, the, the editing, the cartoon, like, performances of like Nicolas Cage and John Goodman and Holly Hunter and filmmaking is kind of even cartoonish in a way. You oh know? yeah. It's, it's like, zooms and stuff. it's like a wily e. coyote movie is what it is. I, I mean, mean, yeah, I mean, especially the end and not to mention that scene when the brother, they break out of jail yeah. and he grabs him. Ah! Yeah. It's, yeah. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's lovely though. My kids love that when I showed it to them last it's year. So, or this year. It's so Whenever fun. It like I just adore that movie. Yeah. Um, so next is Pet Cemetery. Mm. I was really getting into Stephen King at that again horror. I was so I'm in the horror movie, so it's the '80s. I, I dive into Stephen King. I think the first book I ever bought Stephen King was the Night Shift book. Mm. It had the, the the Children of the Corn tie-in cover on it, and uh, I think Pet Cemetery was maybe maybe my f- first. New, I think my dad bought Pet Cemetery, the hardcover to read. So I think was that 1983 ish. Well, I guess it was. Was that when it came out? Something like I can't remember the year. Oh, look, okay. It, well, it, it was like maybe my first Stephen King new Stephen King movie to watch, and it was one of the best, you know. Uh, it was scary, it was. I don't know. I just, I still love that movie. Uh, I just remember it being. Yep. 83. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Great book. That's the book. I read that book and I loved the creeds and the, the book so much that I was sad when it ended. Like I didn't want that book to end. And that doesn't always happen. You know, like you read a book, you're like, okay, I got to the end. That was good. But like, I wanted more mm-hmm. from Pet Cemetery um, Cause I loved it so much. And I loved the movie. Uh, all right. This next one, I know this is a huge one for you. Definitely major for me. Batman. I saw Batman yep. in the theater. That that's what made me want to be a comic book artist. I I saw Batman. I went and bought my first Detective Comics, and I started drawing Batman and drawing comic books and creating my own characters. Uh, pretty much right after seeing Batman. So yeah, bat. I don't I don't have the same ties to Batman now, sadly. Like, when I watch it, it doesn't hit me like a lot of these other movies do. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. I just, bad. it doesn't, it, yeah, I still like it. I just, it's just not one of those movies that when I don't go back to when I do, I'm like, I don't know if this is as good as I felt it was then. Um, but I still love Michael Keaton as Batman. He's mm-hmm. still my favorite Batman. Um, but, um, yeah, I, and I don't have the affection for two like a lot of people do. 
Yeah, he's at home. Washing, washing his, his tights. tights. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love that, man. Yeah. Uh, and it, again, it, it, I went into comic books for 20 years because of that movie. So, and Batman's my favorite superhero still. So, um, that was a huge, huge one for me. Um, another one, guilty pleasure movie, adore it, love it, comfort movie, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Guilty pleasure. That movie's awesome. It, yeah. Well, some people would say it's a guilty pleasure. I love that movie. None of these are guilty pleasures for me. I love all Dude, of them. Yeah. I'll tell you, Bill and Ted, man. Like me and one of my friends, we watched the the movie one night, and then we tried to find clothes to dress like them and start acting like them at school <laughs> the next day. I got because he had blonde hair and I had, uh, you know, darker hair, so I got to be uh, Ted, and he goes, and people thought we were crazy because we were, you know, talking like them as yeah. best we could, which was kind of difficult actually. <laughs> yeah, I saw my my history teach no, no science teacher, a science teacher rented it for us like the last day of school in ninth grade no eighth grade before i graduated from junior mm -hmm. or middle school uh and yeah i just i adore that movie i go that's another one i put on anytime and just yeah be back happy you know? yeah, happy, <laughs> happy 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 yeah i need i need to watch some of these right now <laughs> um, yeah. uh all right this was another big one this kind of changed a lot of things for film uh same year as terminator 2 i believe is Silence of the Lambs. Uh, fucking love that movie. Yeah, I do too. It's kind of like, it almost felt like my first grown up movie. Like, there was something about it. It was like, just, it wasn't like the pop culture movies that I was growing up watching a lot. It was like, you ever, you ever walk out of a movie or, or sorry, when you're done watching movies, just think like, holy shit, that movie felt perfect. This is one of them. Yeah. After, still, you know, after the first time I watched it, I was like, what? This movie was so damn. It had everything I ever wanted that I yeah. didn't know I wanted. You know, and I, I got to see that one in theaters with just me and my buddy, which is probably like I, I guess we were fifteen, mm. so we probably shouldn't have been in an already movie by right. ourselves. But just this theater didn't check IDs, didn't give a shit. So we went. And saw that's also the damage. coolest feeling ever. Yeah, that's probably part of it. Too. <laughs> you know, yeah, we're seeing yeah. <laughs> Buffalo Bill put his dick between his legs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, I loved Silence of the Lambs, uh, and it, you know, kind of, it came out at the right time because that was the year they also caught Dahmer. Mm. Oh yeah, and right. That was everywhere in the news, and I had a yeah. buddy who was like obsessed with Dahmer. He was collecting all the magazine clippings and all this really? stuff. Yeah, I, I was a little afraid of him a little bit after that. <laughs> like, dude, he had he carried around a book like of Dahmer stuff, and I'm like, okay, but. You know, that fascination of serial killers really blew up because of Silence of the Lambs and Dahmer's mm. arrest uh, at that time. And um, I started reading the Thomas Harris books and reading the John Douglas Mindhunter books and kind of, you know, uh, that whole fascination of serial killer kind of thing happened. Which you uh, know now with all the true crime. Yeah, now it's... yeah huge you know yeah. mine hunter became a tv show uh, the john douglas stuff um okay on to some funner stuff another <laughs> guilty pleasure i guess not really let me ask uh, you a quick question yeah. with silence of the lambs was that the first r-rated movie you get were able to get into underage without parents probably okay yeah mine was time cop <laughs> <laughs> that's a little better <laughs> worth it no time cop was worth it not really okay uh, all right, this was another one I saw in theaters with my buddy uh, Jason, and uh, kind of has a T2 joke in it. Wayne's World, oh, yeah, uh, love Wayne's World. Who did so, not love Wayne's World? People, uh, if you didn't love Wayne's World, you're crazy, yeah. Wayne's World is so fun. I was 16 years old, and you know, just so wonderful, yeah, it's just so funny, yeah. Uh, I was listening to Dana Carvey on a podcast the other day. And he was talking about Garth, and he goes, "I based him on my brother, because my brother was just kind of like that, you know." Yeah, yeah. And he started doing the voice and acting. He goes, "It's just a nice, nice character to, yeah, you know." He was doing it. I can't do it, but I can do it. But I don't. I can't remember what he was saying. But it was so. It hit my heart hearing Dana Carvey be Garth. Oh, yeah, all this time later. I love Garth. Garth. I love yeah. Garth more than Wayne. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Garth Elgar. Um. So. He said that's one of his favorite characters because it's such a sweet, 
person to be be for a while. Be in that. Love you, dream woman. <laughs> <laughs> and this last one is one that's not really well known. It was a movie that I really liked and responded to. Watched it a lot. Inspired some of my writing and stuff and comics that I was doing at the time. Uh, Relentless, the Bill Lustig movie. It's Judd Nelson, Leo Rossi, and oh. Robert Loja. Meg Foster. It's a serial killer movie. Uh, probably because Silence of the Lambs was a big deal. Uh, it, uh, Judd Nelson plays a serial killer who uh, picks people's name out of the phone book, calls to find that them. movie. Okay, okay. Leo, Leo yeah. Rossi is like a new New York cop who's in L.A. and Robert Loge is the season partner that he's you know uh, working with. And I just, it's not a great movie, um, but it's one of those early '90s thriller cop. Serial killer movies. Three that, seven. Yeah, I just I watched it all the time. I loved it. And I, you know, I love Judd Nelson from Beverly Breakfast Club, and he really didn't do that much. Really, that was of significance. I mean, he did. You know, oh, Animals, movie wise, I think. Yeah, movie. like you know, like San Animals Fire and all that. But like, yeah. if you really look at Judd Nelson's career, there's not a lot of highlights. Like, there, he did a lot of shitty movies or forgettable movies. You know, San Animals Fire is good, but not really because of him. It's, it's a lot of like Demi Moore and Rob Lowe and some of the other people in it. Perfect. Yeah, um, you know, you're you're probably right, actually. Like the only other thing I could think of that he was like he did that was kind of significant, but really not. Wasn't he in New Jack City? Wasn't he one of the cops? Yeah. Yeah. So, but really, if you look at Judd Nelson's career, not that broad, impressive. not that <laughs> not that impressive, really. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Um. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when I think of Judd Nelson, the first the Bender pops up in my head right away. Yeah, Bender, and that's it, really. I yeah, mean, really, I mean, if you for some reason, I, I remember him like in my head, and he, he, you wouldn't even know it's him, but he was in uh, Jane's Hunt, Bob Strike Back, and for some reason, that's always stuck in my head too, because more of like, oh, that that was him. <laughs> Judd Nelson was in that, you know? Yeah. Barely, but still. Anyway, so I'm jumping into age seventeen to twenty one, kind of those. You're, you're you're driving now. You're going out to movies by your, with your buddies, and you're in college. And you college, rent whatever you want. Yeah, college was a you know rentals were a big big deal. Like yeah. started renting movies, but really when I when I was 18, that's when I became a serious film fan. That's when I saw Reservoir Dogs, and it changed my life. Like it changed the way I thought about movies and what movies could be. It, it, it introduced me to a whole different like movies that I haven't even knew about that I started to go back and watch. Uh, like I said, when you're a Tarantino fan, because he talks about everything he loves, you start to go, Oh, oh I need to see that. I need to, I never seen that. I never heard of that. And, I, and you go, you, you, you discover all these other filmmakers, and all these other films and uh, actors that you didn't know about. And, and you start to watch their movies and that's Reservoir Dogs. Just, Fucking yeah, t t Reservoir Dogs will always be my favorite Tarantino movie because of how much it impacted me. I watched that movie constantly. I had movie posters, T-shirts. I used to. If uh, there were two movies, I'll go ahead and throw the other one out there. My freshman year in college, that I had the VHS tapes and I watched them. If I was I was doing my artwork while I, when I would come home from school, and I'd either have Reservoir Dogs on or Days of Confused. I saw Days of Confused and just fell in love with it, obsessed with it, uh, fell in love with Richard Linklater, Matthew McConaughey, R Rory Cochran. Like I just, mm -hmm. uh, Days of Confused and Reservoir Dogs are both in my top 12. You know, I love, uh, I love Reservoir Dogs, don't get me wrong, but uh, Days of Confused is one of my all time favorites, period. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's I'm, just, I'm uh, doing that. Oh, mate. Like in the soundtrack. You know, for Days of Confused, amazing soundtrack. Big big time for soundtracks with the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, Reservoir Dogs had a great soundtrack. Every Tarantino movie has a great soundtrack. Uh, another Tarantino movie, not his directing, but his script, Natural Born Killers. Came out that year, my freshman year in college. That was one of the most surreal movies I've ever seen, I swear. Yeah. Just so different and so exciting, and Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis and Tommy. Mm -hmm. I mean, just uh, I was. I I don't love Natural Born Killers 
now the way I did then, but at that time in my late teens, early twenties, it was a favorite. I watched it a lot. Soundtrack was amazing. The Trent Reznor produced mix of Patsy Cline and, you know, Nine Schnells and Patty Smith and all. I mean, it's just wild. All the way to Dr. Dre and I was all kinds of stuff. Uh, Randy Miller. Who's he in that one? No, not Randy Miller. I'm thinking another one. Um, Oh, I'm thinking of this one. Uh, rented this one, watched it, loved it. Same same vein, 11 of 45. Um, all right, Roy Cocker, Danny Gil Bellows, Renee Zellweger's first movie, Jeffrey uh, Combs, uh, mm-hmm. Peter Fonda. It's a Lovers on the Run movie like uh, like Tarantino was kind of known for. Uh, made by a guy named Cardi Talkington, who became a really good friend of mine because I did some artwork for 11 to 45 and put it out online, like on MySpace or Facebook. <laughs> I can't remember what it was, which one. And uh, Cardi contacted me. He saw it and he said, man, I want this on a blue black velvet painting. And he's like, can you do that? How can I do that? You know? And I said, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know how to do that, but we became buddies and uh, they were doing a, a screening of 11 to 45 in Dallas at the Texas theater. And they were trying to get, a lot of the cast there. Renee was supposed to come. Peter Fonda was possibly going to be there. The movie introduced me to Reverend Horton Heat, the band, uh, and I be- they became one of my favorite bands of all time. They're in the movie. Uh, I got to meet them because of Cardi, because Cardi knew them going way back to the 80s. And I did artwork for Reverend. And I, uh, But yeah, Cardi invited me to Dallas. To, you know, he, he They got me a room at the Texas Theater. He picked me up at the airport. He drove me around Dallas all day, showed me the Oswald where he shot uh, Kennedy. And and we went to the Dallas State, and I got to hang out. The, like, we were all – Roy Cochran was the only, only, only cast member that showed up, like was able to make it. So I got to hang out with Roy and Cardi. Uh, at uh, you know, Meeting Roy Cochran was one of the coolest fucking – I mean, I love Cardi. Me, Cardi and I are good friends, but – there's something about meeting Roy Cochran because it was like, I mean, everyone knows him as Slater from Days of Confused. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was his name? Lucas. Lucas. In Empire Records. Yeah. So if you ever see, you know, Roy is huge now, really, because he's been doing a lot of cool movies lately. Um, but, you know, Rory is kind of that guy who's kind of like the James Dean, Marlon Brandt. Like, there's something cool about him because he was a guy who didn't give a shit about being a movie star. Mm. And so when I met him, I, I we checked into the hotel, and Cardi's like, "Hey man, Rory's here. And he's waiting for you." The hotel had a it was an old school 1940 style hotel in, in Dallas, and there was a, a restaurant like an old diner attached to the hotel. And he said, "Hey man, Rory's uh, down at the restaurant waiting on you." So I'm like, "Oh shit! I, like I gotta go. I gotta go meet Rory Cochran on my own." You know, walk to the diner and there's Roy with a cigarette let you know just cool as shit movie star you know and he's just like hey man you Nate he's like hey good to meet you because you want something to eat you know and he's like just have a coffee and smoke cigarettes and and that's how I met him just in a diner smoking cigarettes with coffee and he was just so cool and laid back and he's like yeah man I, I love shit like this because I'm able to just relax he goes like LA it's all bullshit it's all people rich people want to hang out with celebrities and it's all fake and phony, <laughs> you know, and he just, we just hung out all weekend and it was, it was just a cool, like and Cardi and I became really, we bonded and there's even an interview with me and Rory and Cochran and, uh, and Cardi that's on YouTube, still on there. This girl was interviewing them and they pulled me in because I did a poster for it. And uh, so that's cemented there that will interview me and the three of us. But I love 1145. It's a movie that a lot of people haven't seen. Um, it was called a ripoff, a, a Tarantino ripoff. Uh, he wrote it way before Tarantino became a star. Um, and actually Quentin was a big, big fan of it. He said, all out of all the movies that, that came out that were called, that were labeled like his movies, that was his favorite. And he actually like, uh, invited Cardi out to get a beer at a film festival. They were playing Pulp Fiction and, 11 to 45 at yep there we are. <laughs> when was this uh like 2012 maybe 
2012. Wow. Yeah, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Yeah. Four, yeah, 14. Yeah, so, but it was, it was a cool time. Um, uh, all right. Jump into 94. Huge movie for me, Clerks. Um, yeah, uh, Clerks was that movie. Like all, all these movies, Reservoir Dogs, Clerks, Days of Fuse, they were movies that made you believe that you could do it. Like I never thought about making movies until I saw these movies. And um, Clerks, I saw on its original run at a single screen theater in Louisville called The Vogue. Me and my, it was, I was in college, Jason Monks and uh, Bruce Jones. We all went, the three of us went packed theater. And Clerks was just something different. You know, never seen anything like it, but it was us, man. We were like, they were, the characters were our age. They were talking about Star Wars and Jaws mm-hmm. and, and shit. And like, I, Jason and I worked at a grocery store at Winn Dixie together at the time so we knew that world of being like working in a service or whatever store retail dealing, retail dealing with customers and dealing with mm-hmm. all that shit and it it, uh, it was just that's my generation that's gen x slackers you know like uh, uh, talking about the stuff that we all loved and all knew we got it it's like they were talking like us um clerks was like an event for gen x Really, I, it really was. If if you were there and you saw those movies, and I became a big fan of Kevin Smith, a big admirer of him, and he did not let me down when I met him. He was one of the nicest fucking guys. He's like really direct, gives you all of his attention. Um, I told him about seeing Clerks. He goes, "Oh man, is that theater still there?" I'm like, "No." He goes, "Shit, that sucks." Yes, um, but yeah, Clerks was a huge deal for me. Uh, of course, I went and saw Mallrats when it opened the day the day it opened the next year. And I didn't get to see Jason Amy in big screen, but saw Dogma. Uh, we were going to talk about Kevin tonight. Uh, so here's our Kevin Smith thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I, still, I still admire the guy. Uh, Clark's mm-hmm. huge. <laughs> I, um, I, 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 was, I was always behind. Like I would come to school and be like, you seen Reservoir Dogs yet? I'm like, no, not yet. You seen Clerks yet? I actually saw Mallrats before I saw either of those. But mm-hmm. I remember, like a lot of people, they, like the. I don't think a lot of people caught on to the View Askew universe until Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back came out. And that I remember makes I, sense. I was working at um, Staples right after I got married when that movie came out, mm-hmm. and all the guys that I was working with were five to ten years younger than me, and they had no idea who Jay and Silent Bob were, but they were like really into that movie. They went and saw it, loved it, and I'm like, but how are you getting it, like? Half the movie are inside jokes. There are all these things that are tied to mall rats and clerks, and and even the 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 uh, like a lot of the jokes are even tied to the co- audio commentaries for those movies. Like there's jokes like Affleck was the bomb and Phantoms. Like that was from the po- uh, the auto audio commentary for like Dogma or Chase and Amy or something. Like there was a joke that they had on the audio commentary for one of those movies about. They kept saying through the whole thing, oh, there's uh, Phantoms Ben Affleck. <laughs> like that was his biggest credit, you know. Um, so that's where that joke came from. Um, but it was such an inside movie that I thought, I mean, you could still watch it, it's still funny, but mm. that movie was so much of a. a Plus, View Askew was four movies deep at that point. Yeah, it was like the fifth one. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, Clerks was and, and Mallrats loved Mallrats. I don't know if I have that on my list, but uh, Clerks was a huge, huge impact. Uh, all right, Tarantino saw Reservoir Dogs, fell in love with him. So I was counting down the days till Pulp Fiction came out. Came out my freshman year in college. Saw that movie six times in theaters. I took anyone who would go with me. Like I just loved that movie. I worshipped it. I knew it. I had the screenplay. I listened to the soundtrack. I had the T-shirts, posters. Uh, fucking nerd fan on that movie. I just love Pulp Fiction. I actually uh, saw that one in the theater, believe it or not. I, just, I was 14. It was one of those movies where just, I actually wrote an essay in college in my writing class about going to the movies to see Pulp Fiction. And I got an A because my instructor loved Pulp Fiction too. Like she said, oh my God, like I just, and we just like nerded out on uh, Pulp Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I remember like reading it. We had to read it in class, you know. So I had to read my essay about going to see Pulp Fiction. And I had people come up and go, I want to go see this movie. Where <laughs> is it still playing? You know? Um, and that was like the kind of the first time I realized that I was a decent writer because I really wrote for necessity before that, like my mm-hmm. comics and stuff, but I didn't really think I was a writer or a good writer. Uh, but it was that class and that paper that my instructor's like, no, you've, you've got something, you got your talent there. You got a voice, you got, you 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 are colorful it comes to life the stories i could you know people were the whole class was like on board like following it and excited and impressed i guess when i read it i was like oh i I just thought i was an artist you know um so another one from college freshman year that i saw before pulp fiction this was this was right i think it came out right after i graduated from high school and me and my dad and my buddy Chris went and saw it. And that is the crow. Mm. I knew of the crow from the comic, but I had not read it. And up until that point, all of my comic books were very superhero based. They were the stuff that I was reading from Marvel and image and all that. So a lot of X-Men type stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, wildcats and all that. Um, But after seeing The Crow, again, like in that summer, I see The Crow, I see Reservoir Dogs, and I'm like, and then I I think I bought the graphic novel for Sin City, the first one. Mm -hmm. So The Crow, Reservoir Dogs, and Sin City, I'm like, wait a minute, I can make comic books like this like they're not just superhero but like they're they're like these gritty crime urban the kind of movies that i'm loving and obsessing over like i can make a comic book like that like what sin city and the crow were so changed my whole direction and and i created a comic book called the malevolent and that's what i worked on for the next 15 years like i put out a graphic novel of the malevolent 250 page book um uh wrote this big one day i'd love to make it a film But that book, which became a significant thing in my life, was because of The Crow and because of uh, uh, Sin City and all that. But, you know, my daughter's named Lily, because that was the name of that character, the main character in the Malevolent comic books. Um, So, yeah, The Crow is a huge, huge impact. And I just hadn't seen a movie like The Crow. It was just, I remember the character, the villains were not cookie cutter. They were... They were colorful themselves. They had great dialogue. I mean, that movie doesn't get enough credit for how defined thing characters are in the world it is. And it was just cool as shit. And the music was awesome. Uh, the, the look of it. I don't know if we'd seen a movie that looked like that at that point. Um, it was just really cool. You know, and I liked Brandon Lee. I'd seen Rapid Fire and we really liked that movie. So, you know, sucked that his in, his career ended there mm-hmm. but uh it was just a really cool movie um all right next one i was huge basketball player through high school so this movie was a big deal saw it on my birthday white man can't jump <laughs> love white man can't jump that's another fun movie i re i watched it again for the first time in years last year and just Remembered every line and every scene and just loved it. Like I just love this movie so much. Love Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes and Rosie Perez. It's, it's good chemistry together. I was gonna say the chemistry in that movie is really good with all oh, yeah. all of them. <clears throat> yeah, and then yeah, Kadeem Hardison and like all the guys, all the your mama this, your mama that on the court. Like it was just fucking hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's just a great quotable movie. Um, just fun. Yeah, I didn't, didn't they re- just recently remake that. They too? remade it, and I haven't even bothered to watch it. <laughs> it's like, I just can't. It's no way it can't. Yeah, I, it, it, that movie. It was like so frozen in time because I was so I was just I worshipped Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls and, and basketball, and like that was a huge part of my life was playing basketball on, on courts like that. And uh, I didn't. I never played for the teams or anything. I just played street ball all the time. And, and <laughs> Yeah, 
I that that movie was just like perfect for me. Um, in fact, when I go back to LA, I have to go to those beaches. I got to go to like where those courts are. Not to play, I can't play anymore. But just to like, oh, this is where I make can't jump. Um, all right, this is an older movie, but again, when I fell in love with Tarantino. It took me to ultra violent cinema. There was a book called ultra violent movies that came out. So it introduced me to these movies that kind of inspired him and that type of filmmaking, uh, a clockwork orange. Oh yeah. The old in out, in out. Yeah. Clockwork orange was like, Whoa, what is this? (laughs) Yeah. uh, That movie. It just, I never seen anything like it. And it was like a fascination. Mm-hmm. Uh, my buddy Jason Monks was really into cinema like this, and he introduced me to a lot of them. He's the one who told me about Reservoir Dogs, and I went and rented it. And he talked about Clockwork Orange, so I rented it. And uh, yeah, I still love that movie. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's not my first Kubrick movie, but um, yeah, it was an obsession at that time. In the 90s. Something came out in, was it in the 90s? Or I mean, it might have been Eyes Wide Shut. That really opened me up to Kubrick at that point. That was ninety nine. It was his was last it, film. Yeah, that was his last film. Because <clears throat> I, because they like right around that time they released uh, um, a, a DVD set that was the Kubrick collection, The Shining, Doctor Strange Love, all that stuff. And but the local theater right after Eyes Wide Shut, because that was posthumously released, wasn't it? After he yeah. died. Yeah. Um, cause after that, I, I got to see clockwork shining, uh, and something else. There was three of them. And then eyes wide shut all within like a two week span. The other, the other one was probably my, seen. my first Kubrick movie, which would have been full metal jacket. It wasn't that, that one. Yeah. That, yeah, that was, was the first one. one I ever saw. Okay. Yeah. Full metal jacket. I remember my parents went and saw that at the theater. 2001. 2001. Yeah. I no, think no, that's uh, but yeah, Clockwork Orange is huge for me. Uh, the next one didn't love this. I didn't. I don't think I saw it when it came out, but I saw it again once I fell in love with Tarantino gangster movies and all that. So, Goodfellas. Uh, me and Jason were obsessed with Goodfellas. We quote it. Um, just was so fascinated with it, and of course. Like the year after I see Goodfellas, Casino came out. I loved Casino. I got to see Casino in the theaters and loved it. But Goodfellas, to me, in my opinion, is the greatest gangster film ever made. Yeah. It's just it's definitely one of them. So good. Um, Plus, you know, uh, there's so many famous, like uh, Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro, and, and, well, Joe Pesci has some great lines in that movie, some great moments. But those three together, uh, Ray Liotta. I love Ray Liotta too. He's one of my favorites. But yeah, it's uh, those three together is like gold. And Robert De Niro, man, I don't know if he's ever turned in a bad performance. But him as Jimmy, and and Goodfellas, god damn, what a performance! Yeah, my favorite you know? actor. Yeah, uh, that that's when De Niro started to become my favorite because I liked I you know I didn't see Raging Bull and yeah. all those movies yeah. as a kid. I I saw. Um, it's a, I not have that movie on here. What was the? I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of the first movie I saw De Niro in. I don't have Taxi Driver here for some fucking reason. That's my favorite movie. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Whoops. Taxi Driver. I saw it at that time. Well, I saw Taxi Driver before Reservoir Dogs, but I did didn't have an effect on me. But after I saw all this, I went back to Taxi Driver, and over the next five ten years, Taxi Driver like kept becoming my favorite movie like i just mm-hmm. became obsessed with it. the more and more i wanted to be a filmmaker the more and more i studied filmmaking and the more de niro became my favorite actor taxi driver just skyrocketed oh. the one for me i think the first de niro movie i saw was when he played uh al capone and untouchables i could have been my favorite first i remember seeing untouchables as a kid Maybe Cape Fear. midnight run mm-hmm. that's another good one uh we're no angels yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen that in forever. Yeah. Awakenings, which is a wonderful movie. Um, those are probably my early De Niro movies that I saw uh, first. Uh, but going back, you know, Deer Hunter, all that shit. I mean, he's just an amazing actor. Mean Streets. When I, yeah, you know, Street first time Street. I see Mean Streets, I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. So, yeah. But Taxi Driver is my favorite movie. 
period. Uh, so this is a movie I saw. <laughs> Favorite movie, period. Period. Um, so this is a movie I, this is I, actually my first Quentin Tarantino movie was a movie that I didn't know it was a Quentin Tarantino movie. Um, True Romance. Mm. I saw True Romance on BHS. I remember seeing the trailers, but I never got to see it at the theater. But I saw it probably right before seeing Reservoir Dogs, probably my senior year in high school. And um, I love True Romance, still love it. It's one of my top 10 movies. Um, Tony Scott, I was a big fan of anyway. Going back to Top Gun, Days of Thunder, Beverly Hills Cop 2. So I was I was always a big Blast Boy Scout. You know, some about Tony Scott's visuals. And he always had amazing cast, like stacked, loaded cast. When you look at the cast on True Romance, you're like, how is this movie not... Because a lot of people still consider this movie an underrated, underseen movie, which it is. Because I remember when it I was didn't going, do well at the box office. Yeah, it didn't do well, but it's like it's yeah. such an amazing fucking movie. Well, I mean, let's count it off. Christian Slater, you got uh, Patricia Arquette, Hopper, Dennis Hopper. I think Val Kilmer. Yep. Uh, Brad Pitt, of course. Gary Oldman, mm-hmm. uh, which you can't tell it's him, of course. Mm-hmm. Christopher Walken. Yeah, I mean, you got a James a Gandolfini. Yeah, it's uh, got. Fucking so who's who of the 1990s? Michael Rappaport, uh, Bronson Samuel Hill, Jackson, Samuel Jackson. It's just amazing, um, and it's a great movie. And it's a it great is. script. Yeah, that uh, was another one of those movies I walked. I was like, God damn, that was good. You yeah. know? I wish I wish there was a true romance every year. <laughs> like, right. It's such a good movie. Um, yeah, it's and, and the thing is, I, I I have not run into anybody who didn't like it once they saw it. Like. The people it's been like, a while since I've seen it, but I love it. Yeah, but it's like it's one of those movies where I was shocked that people had seen it. Like I remember when I was making Girl Number Three, and uh, we were rehearsing, and you know a lot of the actors were and crew were five, ten years younger than me again, and uh, I was telling Julie at the end of Girl Number Three, she has this moment where she just goes fucking batshit crazy and is murdering this guy and just keeps beating him and and then screams. I'm like, this is your this is your Alabama whirly screaming, like after killing James Gandolfini moment. She's like, what's, what are you talking about? It's like true romance. <laughs> like what's true romance. And like, <laughs> and like, I look at like, and everybody there, phone? everybody there had never seen true romance. Oh. Had no idea what I was talking about. I'm like, fuck really? <laughs> so, and this is, you know, 2008. So, uh, about 15 years old at that point. Yeah. Um, no excuses. I, I think it's better known now, but, yeah, for a long time. I don't know, man. We need to put it out there and see like what people think of true romance because you never hear anybody talking about it. Like when they when we talk about uh, a Tarantino movie, and they mostly talk about films he directed, but shit, it's usually the same stuff: Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, you know, Django, of course. Jackie Brown's one nobody ever talks about. That's I love like one Jackie of my Brown. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that movie. Or Kill Bill. Uh, that, that Jackie yeah. Brown's on my list for this period because yeah. I saw that in theaters, loved it. Anything Tarantino, I was I was there for. Um, yeah, Jackie Brown is definitely his most underrated movie. Mm-hmm. I love Jackie Brown, but there's a lot that of people. The that's their that really favorite. Me. Uh, and it introduced me to Elmore Leonard. I didn't really know who Elmore Leonard was, so I read Rum Punch and started reading Elmore Leonard books. Uh, and True Romance is totally an Elmore Leonard movie. Like it, True Romance wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for Elmore Leonard. The original ending of what, True Romance? Uh, I don't know. I like the way... I think... That was my first VHS tape, also. Uh, it was uh, True Romance, the director's cut. The word joke does not age well in True Romance, that side. It's a... You know... The person who told Tarantino that joke was his stepfather, who was black. <laughs> <laughs> so he grew up in that, you know, but yeah, I don't, I don't, it, it wasn't in 1993. That joke was not acceptable. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's definitely not acceptable now, but the thing is Dennis Hopper's character knows that he's about to die and he's going to stick it to these guys. And he knows that, these Italian guys 
aren't going to be happy hearing that. And the thing is, it's true. <laughs> it's And I love that. He's like, am I lying? If you know if I'm lying or not, tell me, am I lying? So, um, yeah, I, I, I get, I get people being offended by it, but, uh, it's, it's, it's real. That's how it is. That's just talk. That's how people talk. It's, you know, you can't hide it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Walk, it's like, he's like, come again. <laughs> <laughs> and he's telling all these gangsters and it's like, I can't survive this, but I'm going to, you know, do this. Um, I want to watch it. I haven't seen it in so long. I gotta watch it now. It's been so uh, long. I just bought it recently digitally because my my DVD had a crack in it. So I was like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna buy the digital." Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. I wanted to get the was it Arrow. They put out like this big deluxe. I keep yeah. needing to buy it because it has like all kinds of stuff on it. Um, I still need to get it. I know my. Oh, it was on it. sale for five bucks on Voodoo. I was like, perfect. Oh, my DVD cracked. Let me just get that. Um, so. Okay, so next up is a movie that uh, kind of ties in slightly to True Romance, but I was introduced to this because of that. Uh, Hard Boiled, my first John Woo movie. Um, you know, Alabama's watching A Better Tomorrow Part 2 in True Romance, which has Chow Yun-Fat. Did you bring that one up at one point in one of our episodes? Yeah, I think it did. Um, but yeah, Hard Boiled, I, I remember renting that and being introduced to John Woo and, and Chai and Fat and just that opening shootout scene and, and the, 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 all the way up to the last part, if people haven't seen I won't ruin it, but Hard Boiled is just one of the greatest action films ever. I'm so glad to see Silent Night this year, to see John Woo back doing a shoot 'em up action movie again. Um, and, it, you know, after I saw Hard Boiled, it just it took me on this whole journey of hero edit. Her heroic bloodshed movies, watching all these Hong Kong movies, uh, uh, the John Woo movies, all the Chai and Fat movies, the Ringo Lam movies, Sweet Heart movies. Um, I just dove huge into Chinese or Hong Kong cinema. Uh, and like I watched anything. There's a, There was a place, it's not here anymore, sadly, but it was kind of an institution in Louisville called Wild and Wooly Video. And they had... They were the video store that you could find the hard to find stuff. You go in there and they'd have the Bergman sec- section and the Chai and Fat section and all that. So I would go in there and I would rent every Chai and Fat movie or every Ringo Lamb movie or every John Woo movie. Yeah, Hard Boiled is incredible. Um, and it was really cool to see Tony Loon show up in a uh, Shang Chi. <laughs> it was like, oh man, it's a dude from Hard Boiled. Um, and I, I would that'd be great to have Chai and Fat in the MCU. I guess he's retired though, isn't he? Is he retired? I think he retired, yeah. Um all right, another movie that came out that year that I saw. 94 was a fucking massive year for me. And uh this was Leon, the professional. Leon, yeah. Leon loved it. You know, again, anything gangster, Gary fucking Oldman, one of the greatest That's villains. One of those that kind ever. of took me by surprise, too. You know, yeah. I didn't expect that movie to be that good. Yeah, it was great. And I, I kind of yeah. knew a little bit because, you know, Luke Basson, who directed it, the, mm-hmm. the movie he made before it was La Femme Nikita. So I mm-hmm. saw La Femme Nikita. I, but the first thing I saw was the remake of La Femme Nikita, which was uh, Point of No Return with Bridget Fonda. Bridget Fonda, yeah. And Harvey Keitel played the Leon which character. Is, it's good, too. Yeah, it's great. It's I like great that, movie. yeah. John Badham directed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took his sister to lunch, dinner one time. <laughs> she was <laughs> scout and To Kill a Mockingbird. But he, you know, he directed uh, Saturday Night Fever and a bunch of other movies. But yeah, Point of No Return was great. And then I saw um, La Femme Nikita, where Jean Reno played the cleaner, the part that Harvey Keitel played in the remake. And the part that Keitel played in his character in Pulp Fiction is based on the character he played in Point of No Return. Oh, really? I didn't think about that. Yeah, Winston wow. Wolf. He's yeah. the cleaner. He's the guy you can call right. to clean up. Uh, that's where. And I, that's where Quentin got it from, that character. It's not a really a connection, but Bridget Fonda's in the next movie after that. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown. And yeah. Jean Reno is basically playing a cleaner in Leon. Mm-hmm. He's in La Femme Nikita as the cleaner. Uh, and again, Natalie Portman, amazing in that movie. Hard Target's fun. 
that was my first John Woo movie, actually. I didn't think I, I forgot about that. Because uh, Heart Heart came out. I think. It sounds like the title of a uh, a mid nine mid to late nineties John Claude Van Damme straight the video movie. That's what it was, right? Like, is it? Yeah, Lance Hendrickson was the villain. Heart Holy Target. shit, that's why it sounds like that. Yeah. <laughs> I assumed it was just another, like a, yeah, a movie. It's a Jean Claude Van Damme movie. It's a Jean Claude Van Damme movie. Is it a Jean Claude Van Damme It is, yeah. Jean Claude Van Damme's a star. <laughs> that's perfect then. Because, uh, we, yeah, because I was. It seems the goal, I would have said too. When, when, when Con Air came out, I'm like, dude, Nicolas Cage looks like fucking Jean Claude Van Damme in Hard Target. He's got the same, <laughs> he's got the mullet, he's got the wife beater, the, the blue jeans, the cowboy. And, and I think they're both Cajun. Uh, uh, really? Yeah, I'm I've pretty never sure seen they are. Our target. So our that's target why I, had... I haven't seen our target in a long time, but I, I'd like to watch it again. I, I I hear like Lance is great in it as a villain. Of course, he's always great. But um, and it seems like there was another connection I was going to make. I thought our target was the, it was theatrical. Yeah, it wasn't direct to video. Well, that's what I was going to mention. Yeah. Um, Ray watch hard target. I don't know if I'm going to be in the mood for that one. We used to joke. <laughs> we used to joke that like if you were a Hong Kong director, it was like was it was it a necessity that you had to direct a Jean Claude Van Damme movie because John Woo had to make tar- hard target and, he, and then he made Broken Arrow after that. But hard target was his first movie. I've seen Broken Arrow. And then when he did uh, when Ringo Lamb came over here, who was a big director over there, he did the one I think. I could be wrong. It seems like he did the one that Dennis Rodman was with Jean Claude Van Damme. Hold on. I think like, I've seen Hard like Target. Double Impact or something like that. With, uh, yeah, that was Double Impact. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of skim through the trailer of Hard Target because I, I saw the poster and I think I have seen it. You've probably seen it. Yeah. Um. So next is Seven. You mentioned that one. Seven uh, awesome. Yeah, Seven was amazing. Never. It just, so another one of those movies you walk out of like, God damn. Yeah. yeah. Like David Fincher. Like I walk. Well, yeah, I, I have seen this. Have, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, Seven. We won't say much about, it, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. A lot of people don't like Seven. That, that was just an amazing film. Who doesn't like Seven? I don't know anybody who doesn't like Seven. It's just that's, that's weird. Yeah, David Fincher, master. Yep, I've seen this for sure. There he is. Um, Black trench coat and mullet. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Huge, huge movie for a horror fan in the mid 90s. Scream. Saw mm. it Christmas night, 1996. Uh, dad was. Oh, yeah, he was. Like, he was? <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird Easter egg. Um, yeah, Scream was an obsession for me at age 20. Yeah, I was just even made a fan film back then with my friends on Halloween the next, the following year. Um, yeah, so we've talked about Scream, uh, but yeah, that was a huge one. Uh, guilty pleasure movie, love it. Comfort movie, we'll watch it anytime, any day. I put it on, my wife doesn't get it. Like, why are you putting that on again? What Scream? No, Twister. Oh, Twister. Oh, I love Twister. I don't get it either. That's my one of my wife's three favorites. I watched it. We, my mom. It was. It came out on my birthday. Uh, was it ninety six? I guess. So yeah, it was twenty. Twentieth birthday. Me and my mom went, and I just loved it. I loved the characters. That's a good I loved memory the right there. That's reason enough. Yeah, I remember. I remember driving back home. There was a storm we're brewing. We're like, oh. Uh, <laughs> we just saw a Twister. We're we gonna see another yeah. one. <laughs> and I think you know. I don't know if everybody's dad's that way, but my dad was one of those guys. Like, hey, there's a storm. There's a tornado warning. We're out on the porch. Like. I mean, you you live over in Tornado Valley, right? Dude, I'm I'm <laughs> always outside. I'll put the kids in the basement, but I'm outside. Like, what is going on out here? You know? Yeah. And so we, the best part is we got this open air sky that you get that where everything comes from the west is over here, and you yeah. can see everything rolling. It's so cool. Yeah. I think that's why Elizabeth picked this place because she she loved that stuff. She, Twister, like I said, is one of her favorite movies. And she just sit outside, just watch storms rolling in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, my Definitely. family, we were like that. I mean, we get them, we get them in Kentucky a lot. I live in um, Tornado Alley. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, top. Yeah, Scream is in my top ten horror. <laughs> Twister is bad, my. <laughs> I didn't say it was a great movie. I, I, I don't it's, think it's bad, but it, I not. I don't get like I don't get why people love it so much. I do like um, some of the characters in the movie. And I love the idea of, of the storm chasers and Carrie Elvis is a he plays such a great prick. Yeah, you know, it's like his prick era. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah, but I yeah, it's it's I'm not saying Twister's a great movie. No. I just genuinely love the atmosphere of it, the like the team, the camaraderie, the can mm. the chemistry, the playfulness. You know, this was like my introduction to Philip Seymour Hoffman. I thought he was great in it. Uh plus it's I, an introduction to uh, the 1996 Dodge Ram. <laughs> <laughs> I just really like that movie a lot. Yeah. Um it's a comfort movie. Again, I wouldn't say it's an Oscar winning movie at all. It's a, it's just a yeah, fun one. All right, here's a classic one that I saw at this in this era of my life that I just I I saw it late. Jesus. But I bought it on VHS at Target, the director's cut, took it home. First time seeing the movie, Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. It, I just had such a blast watching Dawn of the Dead that first time. Like I was like, what? Oh my god, this movie is a blast. Like I just loved it. I loved living in that world for I wanted to go longer. Mm-hmm. It's already like what? It's almost three hours long anyway. It's always a pleasure watching that movie. It is like always. I, just, I feel like I'm with them. That's why I, I don't have the love that other people have for the remake. I do like the remake, but the it. original movie, I just feel like I'm with those four people and, and I'm in that space. And I think also it takes me back to my childhood because I remember when malls look like that, you know, I mm. remember, you know, uh, that, that world. And, uh, so, you know, the, the, the music and the, the, yeah. the fountains and all that stuff. I think it just the goofy. Yeah. I think it just takes me back to childhood, uh, going to the mall, the way malls were in the early eighties. I remember that too. Yeah. Uh, I gotta tell you one thing about the remake. I want, I think for me, I love the remake. I think it's one of the best zombie movies ever made. And of course, I adore the original Dawn. There's no way you cannot. But one thing I got for me, I think it was because it was such a breath of fresh air because we had just come off two years of remakes of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and so and a couple other ones. And finally, I was I was so nervous about that one. And as soon as that that scene, which is a great fucking opening, is when Sarah Pauly the greatest opening ever. Yeah, so when she pulls out of the the neighborhood, her boyfriend chases her, and he stops and chases after somebody else. After she gets away. It's like I, I I felt so good. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be badass. I oh, yeah. I fucking loved it. So, but anyway, yeah, that opening is one of the greatest openings of any movie mm-hmm. ever. I, I I love it. It's just I I think we talked about we did this, I think we did this movie. We did a whole show, yeah. Yeah, and like I just felt after that they introduced way too many characters, and it, everything was just there so was a lot of fast, and everything happens in that day or whatever. And it's like. I love the slow pace of the original. I just love that we're there with these characters. We only have these four characters to get to know. And there's a relationship. It, it, it builds on what Night Living Dead does. Yeah. Where, you know, the conflict and, and it's just a little bit bigger of a scope and a bigger building, obviously. But yeah, I, I agree. Man. I love Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead is good. Sometimes I think it might be the best zombie movie ever. And and for so many reasons. And, and one of them is it's not just it being a great zombie movie, but it's the first one that gave us a little bit of comedy as well. Yeah. You know? I think it's the best zombie movie ever made. Only mm-hmm. other competitor is the original Night of Living Dead for me. Yeah. Um, so the next movie, again, I came to because of Tarantino after I saw From Dusk Till Dawn. Uh, in the opening scene from Dusk Till Dawn, George Clooney says, I will turn this place to the fucking wild bunch. <laughs> and I'm like, what is the wild bunch? So right, yeah. I went and saw the wild bunch. I rented the wild bunch and I'm like, holy fucking hell. Mm-hmm. Like, it's my favorite Western. I love the wild bunch. Same exact thing. I saw it from <laughs> the dawn and I'm like, what the fuck is the wild bunch? <laughs> the blockbuster almost right after and rented it. Yeah. Yeah, I love the wild bunch. It's not my favorite, but yeah, it's, it's up there for sure. And Peck and Bob became a favorite filmmaker. I, I William Holden became a favorite actor. Like I just I love the Wild Bunch, and you know again because of Tarantino, I started taking an appreciation for westerns. And mm-hmm. the other western I fell in love with was a movie that he loves: The Good, The Bad, and Ugly. Mm-hmm. I saw The Good, and The Bad, and Ugly. I was like, holy fuck, I love this. Probably movie. the best western ever made, I'd say. Uh, if, if you ask anybody, that's the one that's going to come up. Yeah. That or like. or his other Leone movie, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, gets competition. Yeah, but I think the Good, the Bad, and Ugly. It's just 
it has a better ending for sure. Yeah, for, it's, for, it's, it's a more it's a more satisfying, fun one to watch. The Wild Bunch is dark and well, you have Tuco in the good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, that enough. Tuco, yeah, Eli Wallach, Tuco, this Tuco is, is phenomenal. Eli Wallach is so fun to watch. Yeah, and Angel Eyes, Lee Van Cleef yeah. is such a great villain. With that standoff at the end. Yeah, and the music God, that's so good. Ennio Marconi. Mm-hmm. I mean, that whole trilogy is incredible. But Good, the Bad, and Ugly is just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and then this next one, a classic movie, but I didn't fall in love with it until I didn't get to see it until I was in this period of my life. Uh, Halloween. Yeah, you know, Halloween is we never talk, heard of it. We've talked about it. I mean, you should see it. <laughs> <laughs> But we've talked about that movie a ton. But wait, like, wait, wait. Make sure you do it for Seth's account. What does it say above the title? John Carpenter's go, Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's the only Halloween that existed in this period. Uh, but yeah. That's true. Yeah. I, <laughs> That's true. I have seen, I've probably seen that movie more than all of these movies somehow. Because I just watch it all the time. And after working on that board game last year, I watched it a lot because i wanted to match everything mm-hmm. perfectly uh i know yeah. i've seen i've seen things in the halloween that no one's probably even ever noticed because i had to draw everything in those houses and in those brooms and i gotta say i gotta ask you about this i yeah. don't know if I, I know i've asked Seth this do you ever just feel like being in the halloween mood like like not this the the the, the franchise or the even just the movie like the other day i was like oh my god i just feel like i need to watch halloween you know, it's a, it's a movie I've seen a hundred times, 150, how many ever times? I'll but it's like, it God, I just feel like watching it, you know? That's it, one of those few movies that it's like that, where I just, I need my Halloween fix. And Jack like, Carpenter's Halloween. And like Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> Seth, <laughs> thanks for the correction. And like Dawn of the Dead, it's a movie that uh, reminds me of growing up in the suburbs in yeah. the 70s and 80s. Like, it just takes me back. Uh, even though you know I was never chased by a psycho in a mask, but those streets. Those then you truly walks, did not grow up in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and somehow, even though there's no dead leaves, it still feels like Halloween somehow. Um, and then this last one was uh, still my favorite war film of all time. I was obsessed with it then. Every time I watch it now, I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, this movie is incredible. Wait, uh, don't say. Is it what I'm thinking it is? Uh, what do you think? Spielberg. No. Okay, damn. Okay. Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now. Oh, Apocalypse Now. I was thinking of the year, because you're getting close to the 1998. Yeah. And Saving Private Ryan's one of the best. Yeah, Apocalypse Now is fucking weird. Yeah. Martin Sheen, holy shit. Yeah, I, I, you know, like, I was obsessed with it, and then like a year or two ago, I popped it in just to watch it. My nephew was becoming a big film buff and he's loving all these movies I'm talking about. Like, it's funny because if you ask my nephew what his top 10 movies are, they almost match my top 10 movies. Like he, he's, he sees them and he's like, you learning from Oh my you? God. Yeah. He's, he's learning from me. And he, he he's like, I, he was discovering he's around the same age. I was then he's a little older and, but he's around that same age. And he's discovering these movies, and he's like, I just watched Reservoir Dogs. Oh, my God, I think that's my favorite movie. I'm like, that was my favorite movie when I was your age, you know? And so, How old is he? And he's, let's see, 22, I guess, around there, 21, 22. Um, but, yeah, he's he's loving all these movies. Uh, let's see. He told me his top 10 just recently. Of course, it changes, but it was Reservoir Dogs. Uh, I won't go into it. Some of them are on uh, coming up. Uh, but some of these coming up are his top ten. I think Apocalypse Now is one of his top ten. Um, which, which version? There are like three or four yeah, versions. I, I, I don't watch all of them. I watched the one I saw first. <laughs> I, the, I, the one, the original cut. Yeah, I've but seen I, all three or four. Yeah, you. Yeah, but I, yeah. I'd always go back. I'd always reach for the original cut. Same like it's like Dawn of the Dead has three copies. Or three versions, yeah, and, and it's. I always go back to the uh, original theatrical more, than, even though I think I do like the, the European cut a little bit more. But yeah, like Apocalypse Now, like I accidentally bought the uh, uh, which one is it, Redo or something like that? Redux, uh, Redux, yeah, I got that one, and it's, it's not my favorite of them, but it'll do. <laughs> That's the only one I have now. So, all right, I'll jump into my last bit. And this All is right. the shortest, but this is uh, from 1998 to tonight to now. 
And of course, a lot of movies in that time don't have the impact that, you know, the first 20 years of my life had. Uh, but there are movies that would come along that newer movies in that period that had a significant impact on me. And then there were movies that were older that I became a bigger fan of. Um, and became part of my all time favorites or, or had influence on me. Uh, the first one is drive, which I know you haven't seen. I own it, but I haven't seen it. Uh, I was doing it when it came out, I think it came out in 2011. Uh, I was a big Ryan Gosling guy, but I had just seen, um, blue Valentine and he really won me over in that. I was amazed by him and that. And, so I was warmed up to Gosling, and then when I saw the trailer for Drive, I thought, well, that looks interesting. And I wanted to go see it, and there was a lot of hype. Critics loved it. People were digging it. And uh, I was doing a convention in Nashville, and I was going to go see it that night. It was playing there. And I was just so tired and beat from traveling to Nashville and setting up and working the show. And I passed, and I still kicked myself because I never got to see Drive on the big screen. Mm. But when I rented it, I was just like immediately from the opening, like, oh, yes, baby. I just was. Oh, yes, baby. <laughs> I just loved everything about it. It starts mm -hmm. off the music, the night calls, the imagery, the pacing. I just fucking love that movie. And I was obsessed and I watched it all the time. I would just put on just the opening 10 minutes just to watch to get my fix of Drive. And. I just, I love it. It's not a movie that everybody loves because it wasn't, you know, people, a movie got sued because everyone thought it was like the Fast and the Furious and it's not the Fast and the Furious. It, there's hardly any driving in it, really. Um, but it's just this really cool noir crime movie with a lot of style, great soundtrack, great music. Uh, I just love that movie. It's one of my favorite movies ever. Um, all right, this was one that I saw in my teens through my twenties, always loved it. But in the last, I'd say the last 15 years has become one of my all time favorite movies. It's one of my five movies that I go to as a filmmaker to watch and study, to be inspired. And that's the shining. Mm -hmm. uh, I just adore that movie. I worship that movie. I, when I watch it, it's like, I, I liked it again, like seeing Twister, seeing them watch The Shining was cool, you know, uh, in the drive in. But uh, just over the last 15 years, The Shining just keeps come being more and more important to me. It more, I become more obsessive about The Shining. Why do you think that is? I just, I think because I became a filmmaker. I think, mm. I think my, once I became a filmmaker, I started to understand filmmaking more, obviously. Mm -hmm. doing the job no learning the crap learning how, you start to see movies differently and you start to see things you're like holy shit, you just see it differently and, and and so when i watch the shining i'm appreciating it for the filmmaking even though a lot of people think that the shining is one of kubrick's worst movies as far as film nerds go oh no it's 2001 oh it's uh, barry Lyndon. no it's all and all those are great they're amazing uh, but the shining for some reason just works for me it's a movie I watch on anytime. Every time I watch it, I'm just and and I just uh, I'm I'm obsessed with it. I mean, I have t tennis shoes with the shining on it, you know. You do, <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah it's, just, <laughs> it's true. Whenever you hear me, uh, and I yeah, you really not hear me do it. Yeah, <laughs> I love the shining. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was one of those that I would always like. The, I was the guy, I don't know if you were you were the guy, but I was always the guy that people would come to about movies later on in high school, like 96, 97. And I, I was out buying these movies. Anytime I got a paycheck from KFC, and The Shining was one I bought pretty early. <clears throat> and I remember I would always, the people come over, you got any horror movies? I do. Here's The Shining. <laughs> and we'd watch that, that or <laughs> Rosemary's Baby. because and, and people always remember me for that. You were the guy that showed me The Shining, the Rosemary's Baby. 
I want Criterion to put a copy of that out, man. They Who dug. owns the rights to it, though? I don't know, but The Shining Let really does, the Shining does not have a great release. No. I have a, a really cool steel book, but it's still Blu-ray, and it's whatever, you know? Yeah. But I would love to see a really great release of that. I uh, love movie. it. I the just, thing I, about I, The Shining is, like, everybody, all these filmmakers, especially in the horror genre today, that is, like, their obsession. Mike Flanagan... It's one of his favorite movies. Jordan Peele, Ari Aster. Well, I mean, Mike Flanagan movie. got the pleasure of making it. Yeah, yeah. like they're all huge Shining people. fans. And The Shining is... I bet there's been more Shining homages in horror movies in the last decade than any other time. Uh, hell, I my Encyclopedia Satanica, The Shining's all over that. I got good news for you, though. What? The, the 1997 made-for-TV movies coming to Screen Factory. There you go. <laughs> Of course, that one would get a good one, right? Um, I, I well, Warner Brothers, I believe, owns the rights to The Shining. Uh, maybe that's so, maybe it's a studio that owns it, doesn't want to let right. anybody do it because I mean, Criterion's done a lot of Kubrick movies, they've done um, The Killing, they've done uh, Barry Lyndon, um, they didn't do Clockwork, I think they may have done um. Uh, Spartacus, possibly. Um, shit, did they do? Maybe that's it. Um, but you know, they're 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 getting the Kubrick, so maybe one day we'll get a Shining. Yeah. Um, the next one is another movie. Again, I saw growing up, liked but never loved until in the last 10, 15 years, and now it's in my top ten. Is Jaws. I don't know why I didn't love it then, but again, I think the filmmaker in me, I watch it and I'm like, oh, wow, wow. I'm just, I'm seeing the filmmaking. I'm seeing what Spielberg did. I'm seeing the writing. I'm seeing the, all this stuff. Like, yeah, it took every, you a long time to love Jaws. Yeah. I mean, I liked really? it, but I was never like obsessed with it. It was never a favorite movie of mine. Yeah. Not, I ever watched a lot. Really? Yeah. And then like in the last, I'm kind of offended. Well, it's weird. <laughs> like, in the last 10 years, I've just become obsessed with it where it's like, I love, I've always loved Jaws. That was one of those early movies for me that I was like, I was probably nine or 10 years old. I saw it. And I'm like, that's, that movie's perfect. Now I see it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I thought about it. Like when I, I remember watching it and, and as soon as Martin and, uh, 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 what's his name are, are on their little ref, you know, I, I'm like, oh, this yeah. movie has the best ending of all time. <laughs> you know, like I love every minute. There's something about that Jaws. I guess Amity Island is, I want to be there. Yeah. You know, I'm going to live in that world and see how that goes. You know, I, I, I wish I was on the dock when Mrs. Kittner smacked him in the face. You know what I'm saying? I, I fucking adore Jaws. I do. Always have. Yeah. It's, it's, it's enjoyable as a filmmaker nerd mm -hmm. and as a, just a movie fan. Like it's just, it's, that's why I think Tarantino and recently. Spielberg's one of your favorites. That's yeah. Weird. Well, like, hey, well, you know, I don't know what it was. Um, in the, yeah, uh, Quentin recently called Jaws probably the greatest movie ever made. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I get what he's saying. He goes because it's a movie that a lot of people love, but it's also a really fucking great movie, like filmmaking wise. Like, and mm -hmm. it's and there's a lot of filmmakers who got into filmmaking. A lot of the people, uh, the, the boomers and the Gen Xers who got into filmmaking were hugely inspired by Jaws and Star Wars. Those were the two big movies. They, they changed cinema. Like people talk about Star Wars, but like Jaws came out before Star Wars. Jaws ago. Jaws was the one that kind of made the summer blockbuster. It was the first summer blockbuster. And then Star Period, Wars. Yes. After Star Wars came out, it was like this is where movies are going. Mm -hmm. And uh you know it's funny people shit on it now like oh it's all these movies no one takes cinema serious like dude that shit was happening before I was even born. Mm -hmm. you know, Jaws changed it the year before I was born. Like Jaws changed cinema uh, forever, and then Star Wars really changed it because everything became special effects driven mm -hmm. and big spectacle. And we don't want to admit that that the '80s movies are what's really guilty for what we're saying now. Yeah, people want to say, "Well, no, there's no substance, there's no characters." Like, there's a lot of movies we grew up in in the '80s that were just spectacle they weren't and they weren't respected then you go back and look at it, like man they were trashed those movies that we love because they were we loved them because we were kids 
you know, so, but, you know, there's, there's, I mean, I'm not saying the movies today like that are better, but, you know, stuff like Mission Impossible and uh, they, these are solid fucking movies, you know, that are coming out mm-hmm. uh, that people don't give the same respect to because, you know, oh, it's not like that. But anyway, Jaws is a perfect movie. And it, it yeah, it took, it took becoming a filmmaker and watching it again and again and again to go, holy shit, man, this thing's perfect. And I could watch it anytime. And every time I watch it, I'm just in awe and I learned something else. Um, it showed me what a genius he, he was or is. Even then. Even then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And Jaws is one of those movies for me that if, if, if I hear that it's playing somewhere in a theater, I'm, not, I'm there. I'm not, I'm not there. No doubt. It's not my favorite movie, but it, you know, it's one of those like I'm there. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna and I took my kids to see it right before the pandemic, and Reynolds was ten and Helena was uh, six. They they loved Jaws at that age, you know. So yeah, it, it, I think you're right. It is a perfect movie, and Steven Spielberg is probably the greatest filmmaker ever. So yeah, I can't argue. I, I, he doesn't get the credit because a lot of people think he's too sentiment sentimental and all that but i fuck you dude like that guy he's not he, he does make these movies that are popular but he also knows what he's doing he does he's a he's a guy who knows filmmaking he knows what to do with that camera and how to tell a story visually and um you know meet the, the, the fablemans and west side story favorite. both of those movies were great uh, fablemans was wonderful yeah um all right i want to jump to my second favorite movie of all time. Um, I walked out of the theater knowing this was going to win Best Picture. Uh, it was it, 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 that was one of those movies where it was getting into my top ten, and then one day I just, I just said, "Dude, this may be my favorite movie. It may top Taxi Driver, and it possibly will one day probably top Taxi Driver for my favorite all time. It is my number two right now, and that's No Country for Old Men." I just love it. I saw it in Florida at the theater, walked out and said, that's going to win Best Picture. It's incredible. And the more and more I watched it, the more and more I fell in love with it. Love the book. Every time I watch it, I'm just in awe of it. Um, <laughs> what's that? Seth, the second grade oh, of Man Carpenter. Oh, uh, Spielberg. Work. Yeah, sorry. Um <laughs> But yeah, No Country for Men, just, I'm in awe. I just admire it so much. Um, just, again, something I had seen. And like Jaws, it has a lot of, like, it has the three male leads, and they're it's, you know, just chasing. I don't know. It's, it's a masterpiece. Well, first of all, it has one of the more terrifying uh, villains that's not a horror film villain, and 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 there's an argument to be said that he's can be just as terrifying as some of, you know, Michael Myers. Because every time he's on screen, you're on the edge of your seat. You're like, oh God, what is he going to do? Because you don't know what he's yeah. going to do. You like that scene you told me about. The one scene that you told me about that made me want to watch it was the gas station coin scene. You yeah. know, and that 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 was early on in the movie too. And damn, that's a good movie. Plus that scene when he's choking. Was he? Who? I don't remember. He's choking out, but. Like you the very see, beginning, very yeah, the very beginning when you you can see the boot marks on the ground because it looks like there's a real fucking struggle going on. You know that movie's gonna be. It like, was genius. I love that's yeah. one of my favorite moments and one of my favorite stories about the making of that movie is that that was a mistake because the the boots were new mm-hmm. and so they were leaving the scuff marks when they were shooting it, and the Coen brothers were like pissed because they're like, oh, it's gonna fuck up continuity. So, like, it wasn't planned, but they put it in the movie, and it's such this great detail because it cuts to that part where you just see all the scuff marks after he's dead, mm-hmm. where you saw that struggle. Like, oh, there's yeah. the evidence of the struggle. And it was such a fucking brilliant thing, but it was all a uh, happy accident. Yeah. And the thing is, when Cormac McCarthy, the, the, the author, went to the premiere or came and saw the movie, and the Coens approached him to get his feedback on the movie he said i love that part with the boots and the scuff <laughs> like that was a great idea guys and they're like <laughs> you know things like yeah hey, right <laughs> yeah wasn't it awesome um but yeah um that that movie's that's just my second favorite movie and it, it could easily 
tie taxi driver or even top it one of these days where I just go, you know what? I got to admit it. I love this movie more. Um, if yeah, it, it's, it's just great. Um, I only have a few more, like four more. Um, this one, horror had become very, you know, stale for me in the early 2000s. And <laughs> uh, I was kind of not really digging the J horror and all that. I mean, The Ring was fun, but it didn't make an impact. Uh, the Blair Witch Project came out in 99. I loved that movie. Uh, but those early 2000s, there were two movies that came out that kind of revitalized my love of horror. And one of them is not on my list, but 20 Days Later was the first one. Mm -hmm. I saw 20 Days Later in the theater. And I didn't love it the first time I saw it. But when I revisited 20 Days Later, I just like, wow, this is fucking awesome. Uh, but the movie that really reignited my love of horror and inspired my first horror movie and uh, got me writing horror movies, scripts, was High Tension. Mm. Uh, I just, I went into a video, that Wild and Wooly video. I went looking for a horror movie and uh, the, the clerk was uh, trying to talk this other guy into renting it. They had a bootleg copy of it from Korea, I think. <laughs> and it's before it got released. I didn't get released here until 2005, but this was like 2003. And um, he, uh, the guy passed on it because he didn't like foreign films. <laughs> so I grabbed that son of a bitch. And, you know, it, it was one of those places where they have all the stickers. So-and-so recommends this and so-and-so recommends this. And it had stickers everywhere. The whole fucking staff loved it. So I got to see High Tension for most people over here had known, known what it was. And I just loved it. I mean, I was just so there. And like the style and the, the, the cinematography and I don't know, it was just something about it that I was, I was just glued to it. It was just this, you know, it was one of the most intense films I'd ever seen. Like, cause you're, you're until you know what the twist is, you know, you're like, Oh, she's going to get caught. Oh, she's going to, you know, you're, you're rooting for her not to get caught. And there's all these close calls and, and all this, so it was so intense to watch and so brutal. You know, like horror movie. This was right before the uh, what, what do they call it, the torture porn stuff. This is right before Saw, mm -hmm. right before Hostel, right before a few Wolf years Street. before those, really. Yeah. So I think there was. It's not the first French extreme movie. I think that was a. Uh, God, what was that movie called? Martyrs. No, this came out before Martyrs. Was it more before Martyrs? Yeah, it was. Shit. I can't remember the movie. There was another movie that came out a few years before High Tension that's kind of called the first of the the French New Wave of horror, extreme horror or whatever. Uh, but High Tension was the first that I saw of it. And then I think, yeah, Mars came out like two years after High Tension or three years after High Tension. And Inside and Them and uh, Frontiers, stuff like that. But High Tension was in my introduction to Alexander Aja. I loved High Hills Have Eyes, when that came out, saw that in theaters. But High Tension was a movie that just kind of lit the fire on my, under my ass as a horror fan again and got me writing horror screenplays. And uh, so it had a huge impact on me. That and then uh, King of the Ants came out that year. Um, mm -hmm. I rented that and I love that. And that inspired my first movie. Um, all right, the, uh, Psycho is on my list here. I liked Psycho. I always liked Psycho, but I always loved it. But it's it's taken even more significance in the last 15 years. Uh, again, as a filmmaker, going back and watching Hitchcock and learning from it. After I saw, when I, every time I watch Psycho, I was just like, it's such a perfect movie. So um, Solemn? Huh? Solemn? No, that's, that's never mind. I'm, I'm looking at French movies that came out. Trouble it's, Every Day. Trouble Every Day. Okay. That's it. Solomon came out two years ago. I don't know why. It's, yeah, Trouble yeah. Every, yeah, Trouble Every Day is, is I think. Oh, Vincent Gallo. The first one. Uh, all right, so these next ones are movies that, the last two, they're not, well, 
one of them I would say is my favorite. I guess both of them are. But I've only seen them a minimal amount of time. They're movies I need to watch again and again and again. One of them I saw way back in the 90s as a teenager. Liked it. Recognized how good it was, but never really watched it again. Uh, but uh, I'll just say it's Seven Samurai. I saw it as a teenager, appreciated it, liked it, enjoyed it, but didn't go back to it for some reason. And then um, the only Kurosawa movies I watched were the, the Samurai movies. You know, I watched Yojimbo and Senjuro and all that, but I didn't really watch uh, Rashomon. I didn't watch Throne of Blood. I didn't watch... Uh, Hidden Fortress. I didn't watch, and then I didn't watch his non samurai movies. So, not last year, but the year before last, I said, All right, I'm going to watch all the Kur Kurosawa movies. He's known as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. I have not watched major the majority of his movies. I'm going to watch them all. So, I watched them all and just realized, Oh, yeah, wow. I fell in love with Akira Kurosawa, fell in love with all his movies, especially like. High and Low and Akiru and Stray Dog and Rosh Rashomon and all that. But when I went back to Seven Samurai, I ordered the Criterion version. And I went back to Seven Samurai. Yeah, immediately I'm like, yes, this is why this movie is so worshipped. You know, this is why this movie has the reputation it has. Wow, is it amazing. Like, watching the Seven Samurai, every time I watch it, I'm reminded of how, why it is known for being what the way it's known. Uh, it's a movie I need. I I should be watching every fucking week. <laughs> like, it's just that good, and I need to. I need to watch it more and more and more. Um, if I had the time to, I'm trying to catch up on all kinds of movies. But Seven Samurai has entered my favorite movies of all time, and it's and the more I watch it, the more it will rise and rise and rise and rise and rise because it's just that incredible um and the other one i have only seen twice um and it's the passion of joan of arc and when i watched it i just was so taken by it um bought the criterion version uh and i just hadn't experienced anything like it it was so moving and so powerful and, and nothing's like it. And it's a silent film, but the music is it was music that was composed for it. I think in the nineties, it's on the criterion version. I think it's called voices of light. And it's so powerful. So wonderful. And I want to see it in the theater so bad with that music. What year did that come out? Like 1928, hmm. I think. Um, it's just, it's Joan, it's, it's Joan's trial. And it's just her being accused and the performance the actress gives. I mean, there's a lot of close-ups. I don't know. I, and I've heard people talk about seeing that movie for the first time, having the same uh, feeling that I had. Like, it was like a spiritual, I guess. And I'm not a spiritual guy. I'm not a religious guy. But there was something about it that, you know, I need to go back to it. Um, but even just haven't seen it twice. I, it's, I've never seen it. Well, I obviously. It, I think it's on HBO if you do want to check it out. Um, if you have HBO. Uh, but it, I think it also changed my attitude towards silent film because I liked silent film, but I, I always had trouble sitting through them. And when I saw Passion of, the, of Joan of Arc, I was like, and then I just I went on this whole thing where I just watched silent films for like two months straight, just nothing but that what got you on your kick. Yeah, I think it was Passion of Joan of Arc. <laughs> I was just like I was just so amazed by it. And then I saw like Sun uh, Sunrise, mm -hmm. the Morning movie, which should probably be on the list. I would see these amazing movies. And I'm like, oh man, and I became like, what am I? What have I been missing all this time? Because and again, I think also it has to do with the filmmaker because I'm seeing. You're seeing what Fritz Lang and Morneau and all these guys. Uh, Victor talked about the Phantom Carriage on the show, mm -hmm. which also had a big uh, Victor Strosum. 
amazing filmmaker. Everything I've seen is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, those are the two that I've added that I've seen in the last few years that I think had these big, I mean, I've seen them, some amazing movies in the last two years because I just started watching all the classics and every movie that's considered great. And there really are some amazing ones. I could sit here all day and talk about them, but <clears throat> Passion of Joan of Arc just had this significant effect on me. And Seven Samurai was one of those movies where, you know, we talk about where you, you, you haven't seen a movie for a while and you put it on, you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is amazing. Like, you know, there's movies that a lot of us have heard about and maybe we never watched. Mm -hmm. You know, those movies that everyone calls classics or the greatest movies of all time and you never watch because you're like, uh, you know, you have to be ready for them. And you put it on and you're like, Oh yeah. So like the first time I saw Casablanca, I was like, Oh, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or the first time I saw Lawrence of Arabia or first time. Or the first time I saw Assault on Precinct 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excuse me, John Carpenter's Assault yeah, on Precinct pushing 13. Pushing that on you. Yeah. Uh, come Both on. You you're gonna, yeah. You're going to like it. No, I, I did. I loved it too. I, mean, I loved you, it. you need to watch drive now, but yeah, I, know, I, know, I, I don't know if you'll like drive because drive is very, it's a very divided movie. There's people who just hate it. Don't think it's good. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, of course, Seth chimes in. <laughs> Thank you. It's all it's Seth. He really pushed it because he bought me a copy and sent it to my house without even asking me. So <laughs> yeah, I remember he told he's me a he carpenter goes, pusher. He told me that I can't remember what. But yeah. He told me he was smelling one to you. Um, I appreciate it too. I watched it, loved it. Now Dude. you gotta watch Vigilante because I think you'd like that one. I don't Which know one's that one? Seth saw Vigilante or not? Uh, it's um, William Lusted, the guy made Relentless and Maniac Cop and maniac and it's a 1983 movie it came out the same day return of the jedi came out so oh, no one fucking saw it, it came out 83 the worst timing ever yeah it's robert <laughs> For robert forster and fred williamson and oh robert it, forster yeah robert I forster it, it, i think it would be a great double feature with assault because it's like it's that whole street gang thing where robert forster's wife has a run-in with the street gang and they follow her follow her home and they murder her and his Oh, Fred Williamson? Son or daughter. He killed him, his wife and his kid. And, uh, you know, he's just a blue-collar working Joe guy. Spinell. Yeah, and he meets William, Fred Williamson and some other guy, and they are starting this little group of vigilantes, and they all work together to find the, the gang that killed his family and, you know, get revenge. Um, but it has... To me, it has a lot of feel the same. It does take place in a prison. It's not a siege movie, but there's something about, I guess, the urban warfare gang violence uh, thing um, that kind of reminded me of Assault. It um, was released in Sweden in 2007 for the first time. What, Vigilante was? Yeah. That's so odd, isn't it? I don't think I saw it until uh, after Jackie Brown came out because I, I, I didn't really know Robert Forster. That's where I, that's where, yeah, how I found him. And yeah, I love him. Yeah, I love that guy. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's my list. Great voice. He's got a great voice. Oh, yeah, he got a very great, yeah. One of my favorite, favorite parts of Jackie Brown is when Sam, Samuel Jackson, like when they're driving to see Jackie and they get in the car, and he puts, he gets in the car, he turns it on, and the Delphonics comes on, mm. and Samuel Jackson's like, "You like the Delphonics?" <laughs> and Robert Frost was like, "They're pretty good." Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it, it's, it was it, a good one. Yeah, but that's my list. I mean, there could have been a lot of other movies, but when I thought about those periods and what impacted my life, or what has grown on me, or Jake yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, and you said at the top of the show that there uh, there are some of mine that would definitely cross over more early films and some of the horror, of course, because we've spent countless hours talking about horror on this show for the last four or five years now. Yeah. Shit, I think it's this is the fifth year overall, 2021, two, three, 
yeah, this is our fifth year of doing the show. Um, congratulations. <laughs> we made it this far. Um, but yeah, like, uh, there are some that you did not mention that are definitely, uh, oh, that's his final role. Oh, okay. Oh, great movie. Yeah. Um, that, that are definitely on my list that, you know, cause a lot of the stuff from when we were younger, we all grew up watching some of the same stuff for the most part. I did miss a few, like the, the fan the high fantasy stuff, but like between like 1990. Two in 1999, 2000 is when I really started to open up to, to watching more. You know, and cable. I, honestly, when I saw an actor I liked, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Bruce Willis. Let's just say, uh, I would go out and and we'd I would rent everything I could find that was Bruce Willis. You know, I remember that's how I did. Well, like when I saw Reservoir Dogs, I didn't know any of those actors other than Chris Penn. Yeah. Because of Footloose, you know, and all that. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His brother. But so, like, so, like, I'm like, all right, I got to see all these Harvey Keitel movies. So, all of a sudden, I'm watching Mean Streets mm -hmm. and Bad Lieutenant and, you know, things like that. And then Tim Roth. I love Tim Roth. So, I went and rented Bodies Rest in Motion, which I loved, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other movies with him. And Michael Madsen didn't have the greatest filmography, but I'd start watching movies with him. And Steve Buscemi. <laughs> Michael like, Madsen, you know, so. Yeah, and so, yeah, and, yeah, there's... Yeah, you just there's so many things like, and there's so other many movies that, you know, the movies that um, I watched a lot that maybe this generation doesn't know about or they do. The movies you'll mention to people like, oh yeah, I used to watch that like Just One of the Guys or <laughs> Tough Turf was a movie that I watched a lot. I don't know if you've heard. Just that. One of the Guys is something I watched the shit out yeah. of when I was younger. A lot of people Where do you get off having tits? <laughs> <laughs> But like Tough Turf was one that I don't know if a lot of people saw or watched, but you know it had a uh, uh, James Spader and Robert Downey Jr. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, God Lindsay Wallace's older sister. I can't remember the real life sister. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember her name, but uh, she's hot as hell at it too. Uh, but it's like this, you know, James Spader plays this new kid in town, and he comes friends with Robert Downey Jr. He's kind of a weirdo. And he kind of starts a beef with the local hood and his gang at the school. And they're... Yeah, he, look at James Spader. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just we used to watch that all the time. And uh, there was a movie, there was a scene in it that horrified me because they want to beat him up. And they... I think you talked about this. I think I brought this up before. I think you talked about seeing it in the military where they would... Uh, put the soap or the keys yep. in the towel. Yeah, the party is what they call it. Yeah, so they do that to him in, in the locker room. And um, Kim Richards, is that her? Kim Richards, yeah. It's uh, Kyle Richards' sister. Is she the one in the meme? I think so. Yeah, the one's like yelling at the cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at up uh, in Tough Turf. Tough tur she was pretty smoking in that. Uh, yeah, she looks like it. And then, and then uh, it on Amazon. I've never seen it before. Jim Carroll was in the movie, and his dude. song uh, "People Who Die" is constantly played in it. Like, look at look at this dude. Look at can you see it? Just yeah, look at James Peter. Look at that. <laughs> and it was a different role because he always played kind of the the douchey guy, and he was like he's like the hero in that movie. He's like the. Well, he did that in the New Kids, also. Or no, he was a bad guy in the New Kids, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah. Um, I can't, there's another movie that those two are in that I can't, I don't think I could ever watch again. What's, uh, that? what's that movie? Robert Downey Jr. Hooked on Drugs. All the uh, Less Than Zero. Less than, I can never watch that movie again. Yeah. I have the novel or the book or whatever, but I'll never watch the movie again. Of course, there's tons of movies, but uh, yeah, I wanted to really pinpoint like, all right, me and my family watch this all the time or I watch mm. it. And I, I, when I think of you know, I may have started dressing like those characters or, or when I think of that type of film, I think of that movie specifically. Um, so, yeah. So I'm looking forward to year all to see. I mean, again, I'm sure there's going to be some crossover. Um, That's okay, because we'll, we'll do it between other uh, episodes. Uh, yeah. We'll try to get to Red State next week. Uh, I found my DVD like right after I got home. I was like, okay, okay I do have it. <laughs> Cause I was like, I, I do I have this? Uh, which I do it's a DVD, but still, um, yeah. And I, I'll compile mine. It's going to take a little bit of memory to remember. Cause like, I remember 
one thing I wanted to say when you're talking about Return of the Jedi is like I got sick of Empire Strikes Back growing up so much because I never got to see Return of the Jedi or Star Wars. It was always that one. My mom would be like, Star Wars is on to come downstairs, and I saw the ad. That was the I've seen this a thousand times. And that was the opposite know? of that because I saw Empire less than the other two. Like I saw Star Wars all the time, and then I saw Jedi in the theater, and that was like, I guess I was at the right age where I was obsessed with Return of the Jedi and everything Return of the Jedi. Yeah, and and that that was my third birthday was when Jedi came out. My mom told me she took me to the, the theater. Of course, I didn't remember, but she said I was obsessed with Luke's green lightsaber after that. And I yeah, she, same. She bought me one. Yeah, I had that um, one, the black yeah. candle one. Yeah, she even she even made me a, a hood because I had this little blanket. It was like my baby blanket, and I would tie it around my neck and make a hood out of it and stuff, and try to be Luke from the you know the early in the, in the movie. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, there were so many cool things about. It. I mean, Jabba the Hutt, that whole sequence, mm-hmm. the skiff jumping out the Sarlacc pit. Um, when I really look back at it, Jedi is arguably my favorite because of stuff like that and the whole face off on the. Death Star, Emperor's Throne Room. Um, you know, when I was seven years old. The Ewoks were cute. They were funny. Like, Wicket was cool. I mean, yeah, was, they didn't bother me. They still don't yeah, bother me. Yeah, but... they don't bother me at all. Yeah. Uh, and I still remember walking out of the theater uh, in tears. And my mom, like, what's what's wrong? I'm like, Luke's daddy died. You know, mm-hmm. I, was, I, I was emotionally wrecked that Vader died or, or, or Anakin died. I or, uh, because Luke was my hero and his dad died, and it was I was heartbroken. I, I I literally walked out of the theater in tears <laughs> in Revenge of the Sith. So, but that was, to my understanding, to be the last Star Wars movie ever made. Yeah, I remember walking. Out, <laughs> so, like it's over. I remember I was at working at Staples when Revenge of the Sith. The, the theater was right down, like in the same strip mall that I worked in at Staples, and. I saw Sith and I walked down to Staples to say hi to the guys. And I said, yeah, I just saw Revenge of the Sith. And I said, what was it like? I was like, I feel like I'm seven years old. Like I, feel, <laughs> yeah. I have this, it was like seeing Return of the Jedi. Like mm. because Sith connected the dots, it was the most like the original trilogy that yeah. we'd gotten. And like I was seeing, I when when Anakin is called Darth Vader, when he dubs him Darth Vader and that mm-hmm. music starts playing, you're like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. It's dead. Heavy. It's heavy. And then, yeah, even now, you know, when when Obi-Wan and, and Anakin fight, it's it, it's still, it's cool. It's a, Sith is a cool movie. It is. I love it. It's uh, people, I mean, I love the original movies, but sometimes I'll watch Revenge of the Sith and I'm like, man, I feel like that's my favorite, and I don't care what people say. I love Revenge. I love, but I, I love all Star Wars movies to a point. But that's all we'll say about that. Yeah, <laughs> that'll lead to a longer discussion. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll we'll do a couple of uh, get back to the regular show. Uh, I'll have Seth go next when we do this again, and then Jared or Jared and then Seth, whichever way I'll go last. Um, gives me more time. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, but I, I really all I got to do is take a look back in, in my my history. I've got a lot of like you kind of started. If, if I go based off of the way you did it, it'll be a lot easier. Yeah, I'll, send you, I'll send you my outline. Of, yeah, like, that'd be cool. Just ages. put it in a group if you could. Because I, I think, like I said, the first five years, you know, is a significant time. But then, you know, that six to ten, like that kind of first grade to i guess fifth grade yeah grade school is a really special time for us i think developing and learning stories and learning friendships and all that stuff and then you get into your middle school teenage years like i put like from middle school to driving age 11 to 16 and then once you get into driving 17 or whatever you're in your college years you're kind of in an adult era which is a different you know, once you get that 18, 19 years, I don't know about everybody, but, you know, going to college, you, you know, it's kind of stereotypical that people start expanding their horizons and experiencing mm-hmm. different things and trying other 
types of music and other types of reading different things. And you, know, you, you, you start reading like Hunter S. Thompson or, you know, Burroughs or something like that. You know, you start getting introduced to sub like uh, subculture and a, uh, culture becomes a big thing and yeah. music and, and, and like lifestyle and, and uh, yeah, I, I 100% agree with you. It doesn't have to just be just college. I'd, I'd say between 18 and 25 yeah. is when you really start expanding and trying new things. And I got to tell you, Hunter S. Thompson plays a big part in my my list oh, yeah. because of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I saw that, read the books, uh, I read, and then I saw Where the Buffalo Roam with Bill Murray. You know, so yeah, I saw Fear and Loathing probably over the course of three years, probably at least twice a week for. I know that movie up back and forth is ridiculous. Yeah, I remember reading that book for the first oh, time yeah. and laughing out loud. Like mm-hmm. I, I was in public. I'm like, just Hunter's his voice, like the, the way he talks. Have you ever uh, the Criterion DVD? There's a uh, it's him and Johnny Depp doing the uh, the uh, commentary. If you've never listened it's not, to it, he's, 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 he, uh, Johnny doesn't do it with him though. It's just, Isn't just, it Johnny? It's Hunter and like his assistant or somebody from yeah i don't uh, remember who it is but the hunter part part's the only part i cared about yeah yeah you know, like, like, well, hunter watching the movie like i remember specific things he would say because i know johnny wasn't with him because he says uh the girl asked him that's with him says i'm like what was, what'd you think about johnny playing you he goes it was always a dream to be played by heartthrobs <laughs> preferably short ones <laughs> i just remember him saying that uh, play heart be played by heartthrob, and then uh, I remember the scene where he throws the change on the floor mm-hmm. at the at the flamingo, mm-hmm. and uh, Hunter's like, "I wouldn't have done that. That was rude. I wouldn't that, say I wouldn't have done that. He made that up. <laughs> he goes, I wouldn't have treated that person. I always treated the help well. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't like, have to watch that again. The uh, the comments there because it's been I since I've had that DVD. That's that's still one of my favorite movies of all time, Fear and Loathing. Um, American History X, The Big Lebowski, uh, and some of these are, are no oh, brainer. Yeah, like American Psycho, went to the one. theater a lot of that period. I remember seeing me and Jason, the cat monks, I talked about my movie buddy, went to U of L together, worked at the grocery store together. Oddly enough, my nephew, who I told you is all in the films, mm-hmm. is his best friend is Jason's son uh, who they met playing baseball, like small world thing. Like they grew up together playing baseball and now they live across the street from each other. And now they're like best friends. And like Jason and I were like close, close friends in my twenties. I made comic books. My, my first comic books, uh, Feral comics was with Jason. Um, And, you know, we grew apart after that, but, I see him all the time now because like when I go see my sister, he lives across the street, you know? Yeah. So we hang out. If my sister's having to get together, Jason and his wife come over. And, uh, but yeah, I don't know where I got on that, but um, yeah, I don't, I got, I lost track of what I was talking about. And I got, uh, that's, that's okay. I, yeah. they, I think with, uh, the, with our generation, something like this works, you know, and I know, like Tarantino's a Tarantino. How old is he now? Is he in the sixties yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's is he? He's probably sixty. Yeah. It, there are a lot of the older movies and such, and and movies from the seventies that probably influenced him. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot. I, this when you brought this up, my mind started racing. Like, oh man, <laughs> like I started thinking of all the movies that I grew up with, and oh. There's a lot of weird ones too. That, like you said, I don't know if your list will be like. Just wait to the early '90s when you know, like there was. That's when like straight to video started happening, and I was like renting all kinds of weird oh, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I could, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. I rented had, a lot of stuff in the '90s. Yeah, we had a. Uh, um, it was a uh, a grocery store called Schnooks. I don't know if you guys have them in, that, in your area. I think it's a Illinois Missouri thing. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, we had one up the road, and they had a, a video center inside, and everything was a dollar. I was up there all the time, rent movies, you know, because I that's how I saw Freddy's Dead. Actually, I didn't see it on the theater mm. in the theater. I, I I rented it from there. And uh, that's like I was up there as soon as I, I found out that I could do that because I was like 12. I think uh, I rode my bike up there and rented a sack full of movies, got some crystal clear Pepsi and had a weekend. You know, that was that was awesome. 
So, yeah, it was, it'll be yeah. fun when I get to mine. I'm curious about Seth and Jared also. Yeah, they all have those things that we saw. And, and mm-hmm. there'll be movies. There probably won't be many that I haven't seen that you guys will bring up. But, like, there'll be movies, like, that I wouldn't have, like, I don't have, like, some attachment to. But mm-hmm. it's always cool to hear what other people uh, are really attached to. Like, you talked about, that's what I, me- I remember, like, Jason and I going to see Kingpin. Oh, yeah. And loving that. And then Big Lebowski came out like shortly right after it. So, mm. like, all these bowling movies. And, you know, I just remember, oh, loving, yeah, I so, yeah. I just remember loving those movies. I just remember, like, when when Kingpin starts and he walks in in the 70s, you know, yeah. and takes the guy's pizza. <laughs> yeah. And he's doing, you know, all that. It was like, oh, it's cool. And then Bill Murray was so brilliant in that movie. He's one of my mm-hmm. favorite Bill Murray performances. Mm-hmm. Bill, Bill Murray is pretty brilliant. Such anyway. a prick. Like a, the part where they're eating at the diner and he looks over those girls at the booth and he goes, hey. And the girl looks over and he goes, not you. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> he tells Woody Harrelson, Can you take, why don't you take that outside and eat it? Because <laughs> he's like annoyed by eyes slurping. I outside. that was another one that I had to wait to see, and everybody's like, "Just wait till you see the nipple scene." I'm like, "The nipple oh. scene," and I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and I saw it. I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a fun movie. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's some weird stuff for sure because I I had a lot of late nights in the summer times when I was growing up too, so I had to watch a lot of it. Like, there, do you remember Don the Dragon Wilson? Mm-hmm. I can't remember the name of the movie offhand, but there was one movie he was in. Where they had to do like bare knuckle with glass on their knuckles and shit. I can't remember the name well, of the movie. Was, or there's a Van Damme movie like that. Yeah, let me Kick let me Bar- look up that. Kickboxer? Did they do that with the glass? I, I've actually never seen Kickboxer. Because they they put the tape and they put their hands in the glue and they get. Well, I think they. Glass. Yeah, they I think they lit his knuckles on fire. Oh. Let me see what if I can find the movie because about I Van never... Damme, I, I thought about my, my my favorite Van Damme movie, the movie I watched a lot. Back then was a cyborg. Mm-hmm. Watch cyborg. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you what my favorite Van Damme movie is. I was more of a Steven Seagal guy, honestly. I remember watching the No Retreat, No Surrender a lot when I came. Mm-hmm. Out. That's yeah. a good one. I gotta find this movie because I can't remember what it was, but I watched it all the time. He was in Batman Forever. I forgot about that. Ring of Fire. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was called Ring of Fire. Yeah, there were there are so many like a lot of martial arts or they like like to these straight to video. He played to... John Woo, by the way, oh, in yeah. that movie. <laughs> he was Johnny Woo. Yeah, all these little like thinking like Rutger Hauer did a lot of these movies. I remember watching like um, Blind Fury, where he played the blind. Oh sword. yeah. And, and then um, it was called Wedlock. He did with Mimi Rogers, where. I remember when Battle Royale came out. There's people, you know, talk about Battle Royale and Hunger Games and all that. Well, I remember Wedlock and maybe uh, did Running Man have it too, where they had the bra- neck brace, like things around their neck. And they're in prison. Mm-hmm. I think so. Because then, yeah, in, uh, in Wedlock, like you were tied to somebody, and if that person tried to escape, your thing would go off and your heads would explode. Um, yeah, yeah there's it, so many movies watched in the 90s because I, I mean, cable and then going to the video store constantly. There's so many movies I forgot, you know, or, or and again, like I said, we watch them so much and if you forget about them and then you, you watch them again, you're like, holy shit, I, I like Loaded Weapon Part One, I revisited last year, two years ago, I'm like. I remember everything about this movie, and I I did not think I did, and I re- I remember watching it, but not I, I must have watched a ton because I know lines of dialogue, and I know what's going to happen. I love that movie, by the way. Yeah, there's I like all it. these little movies, yeah. like Stakeout and Loose Loose Cannons, and oh, man, it's just endless. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, looking this, forward to your all's list because it, it's fun. the It'll generation. Definitely yeah. hear from the others too. Yeah, because I remember, and especially when there is different generations, because I remember uh, a guy named uh, Jason, who 
he I had done my 100 favorite movies list, and he said he decided to do his. Maybe we were doing comedies, but I remember he started. He was 10 years younger than me, and as he was posting his list, there were these movies that I remember seeing in the 90s, but they didn't matter to me. Like they didn't, they didn't register with me as much or didn't yeah. stick with me. But they were like, like what Ferris Bueller or just one of the guys or what that was to me that these late nineties comedies were for him, like saving Silverman and mm. stuff like that, where like, I remember liking that movie and think it was funny, but like, this was like one of his all time favorite movies. And I'm like, really? And, but I'm thinking, well, yeah, that was the movies. That was a movie that came out when he was, you know, 13, 12, 14. And yeah, that movie would have been one of my favorite movies. I think about like in 1994, when I was, 18 how much i loved ace ventura you know <laughs> like now i probably couldn't watch it like I, I think i've tried to watch ace ventura recently I'm like god it's, it's kind of stupid it's hard, it's hard to watch now yeah, yeah. but it's I like it. where'd I, you get that gum ace that's none of your business man but then again like dumb and dumber is still fucking great so the dumb and dumber is still pretty funny the, one of the movies that i loved uh when i was of age 18 19 was american pie and that movie does not hold up at all like yeah, I did. like I, that one didn't mean much to me because I loved it so far it will, past my generation. Of, it was exactly like it was a class of '99. Essentially, we were class of '98. But the four friends, I had three friends. I was like one of those guys, you know. And it was, I mean, we weren't like that wasn't our main mission in life to get laid. Yeah. But like you know, I can relate to those guys and and still watching it. Uh, in the in the uh, the second one and the reunion one, the, the wedding one's terrible. But yeah. I, I watched them recently. I'm like, God, these movies, they they kind of hit me <laughs> in a weird spot. You know, there's the raunchy comedies, but they remind me of what I was like. At, that was like a, a time capsule for me, you know, for when I was in my late teens, early 20s. So Yeah, there were but, movies that I watched a lot at that period that mm-hmm. were, that did click with me. Like, I think we've talked about it, Can't Hardly Wait. I love that movie. That's another one, one yeah. that I really loved. And then there was... Uh, the Romeo and Juliet movie. I loved that one. And there was like the one with, uh, I mean, just like kind of not good movies, but movies I watched a lot was, uh, was it overnight delivery? Yeah. With Paul Rudd and Paul uh, Rudd and Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon. Yeah. I used to watch that a lot. It's another one I bought on voodoo for five bucks recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That one's not great, but it's, 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 yeah, I remember it like does it. its job. I probably had a crush on Reese or something. Yeah. Well, did you ever see a, another movie uh, that I really liked that came out that time? Not the same type of vibe, but you ever see Excess Baggage, Alicia Silverstone oh, and uh, Benicio del Toro? It's another good one from around that time. One I liked with her was, was silly. It was Blast from the Past with oh, Brendan yeah. Fraser. I Brendan remember Fraser. Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken steals the movie, him and Sissy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Don't go in the adult store or whatever. There's a lot of good stuff in that movie. There's a lot of good stuff. Like, there, I mean, I don't know. In horror, like, we talk about horror a lot, obviously, the horror syndicate. But, like, in horror, that's a dark time for horror. Mid-90s, even even after Scream came out, there was still a lot of bad horror movies being made. But there were a lot of fun kind of yeah. movie-type movies. That everything were, that came out after Scream was just a knockoff of it, and they just yeah. weren't as good. Like, I... I have no nostalgia for like Valentine. Urban Legend was okay, but I it was so there was so much of Scream in that. I did like I, I know what hated you, that movie. I know what you did last summer. I liked, but now I don't really like it as much. It's uh, very good, honestly. I didn't you know, like it very much. I, I hated the sequel to yeah. the, the, the sequel. one of the worst horror sequels of all time. Uh, so when I really look at that era. The screen movies, the first two screen movies are the only ones I really look back at going, yeah, I love, I love those movies. The others, I don't have to watch ever again. It's uh, more, I think, horror. Like, people start saying, after Scream, everything. I think it's more uh, mid-2000s, post-28 Days Later, I'd say, is when things started to pick up for horror. Uh, there's some good things sprinkled in there, Blair, yeah. Rick, as you said, you know, but, you know. You know how it is. Yeah, twenty days later, to me, it was the the, the zombie movie came back. Uh, of course, they started doing a torture porn stuff and the mm-hmm. extremes, the French extreme. But it's also when the South Koreans started really cooking with like Oh Boy and and Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and 
Lady Vengeance and all those movies. I've seen The Devil as one of them. I, think. I saw The Devil. I saw The Devil, yeah. Tell the Two Sisters. Um, and then we got stuff like Wreck and Shaun of the Dead and uh, The Descent mm. and Inside. I mean, really, oh. horror really started cooking in the mid 2000s. Speaking of Wreck, Seth wants to do a show on all four of those movies because okay, I think uh, he's trying to make me watch all four of them. So. <laughs> We'll have, I guess we'll have to. Anyway, is there anything else you want to uh, say before we uh, get going? Another yeah. marathon episode for us. Good times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought we, you know, we just shoot the shit and yeah, talk about fun. stuff we love. And it's uh, always fun again, revisiting old stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's some people who, you know, they come to the horror groups because they like horror and they only like horror. But I think a lot of the people that watch this, I mean, we know Alex is a star wars guy and uh, you know if you're a certain age you you love all these things and my hope also is always to introduce people to other stuff um i think horror fans have seen most horror um so there may be something that's on my list that people haven't seen yeah rec three is fucking great i didn't like rec four very much but you know i'll sit down and try to watch um, them all I, Eric Four is not bad. It's just not as good as the first three movies. I mean, the first movie was good. It just made did I felt bad like after watching it, not like emotionally, but like head hurt, stomach hurt. It's that fast moving camera and trying to read at the same time. It's like being in a car trying to read a book. <laughs> it's, it's the best way I can exp- uh, you know explain. Right. It. it was one of those movies. Like there, there were movies that I was getting at conventions when I started mm-hmm. doing conventions, and uh, I, the, the horror ones I would rent. My buddy Sean, who I did Girl Number Three, but I met on town, we became best friends. And they were the movies where I'd watch and like, hey, you need to come over and watch this. Like right. right after I watched it, I was like, you need to come over and watch this. And Wreck was one, and Martyrs was the other. I remember, like after I watched, like, Dude, you gotta come tough, over and watch this movie. Watch. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. But they were like, yeah. holy shit, you need to see this. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I'll ever watch Martyrs again. That was a that was a tough one to watch. Yeah, um, I've only seen it like two or three times, and yeah, the, the last time I watched it, I was, oh man, it, it, it's uh, there's some like the, that extreme horror era, torture porn era. You know, like again, watching Saw Ten, I really liked that movie, but when it got to that, uh, you know, the opening kill trap thing, I'm like. Oh, uh, and then especially the first trap with the group that she's he's getting revenge on that that first is it trap. the girl that has to cut her own leg off or whatever yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah i'm like i don't want to watch this and it's it's one of those things where it's the sound too so it's like, <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah and she's using that wire right yeah and it's so yeah. hard to watch it's so hard to watch and i'm, yeah. I'm like I do not miss. That's but what always kept me away from the story. Yeah, the story good. was so good. Yeah. And it's it's kind of like I would like it even more if I didn't have to watch that part. You know, like I wouldn't have to see yeah. that stuff because there's there's stuff like sometimes I feel like they went too far. And you know, it's like I really loved Hostel too, but I remember like the scene with the Lady Bathory scene. I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, you went too far with that. It was too hard to watch. It was too. It was too brutal. It was just something so upsetting about it that I'm, I, I, I am not enjoying this at all. And that's the thing. Like, there's, I mean, the thing is that the the audience that it's made for, they do enjoy that stuff. The, the the terrifier crowd, those people who like love to see that. And I have an appreciation as for the artistry that the the, the effects team are pulling off, and the editing and everything. But I think my I remember when Saw came out, I said, this is just seven without any class. And that was my response to seven. Like, it's it's the same story. It's like self-righteous killer who's using righteousness and, and things against, and he's using these clever ways of killing people uh, to do it. But in seven, we're not shown anything. We're shown the aftermath or we're told about it. And it leaves it up to our imagination. So instead of seeing... You know, the guy having sex with the prostitute with the knife dildo or whatever the hell they had on it. Like, we don't, we see her out of focus. 
We see the guy crying and fucked up, and he put that thing on me. He made me do this. He still had it on too. And they, yeah, they showed. The, he goes, "Get this thing off of me!" And they show a Polaroid of it and uh, of what he had on him. And it's like that's all I needed. Like I didn't need to see the the violent every cut, everything. And and to me, the Saw movies were, as they said, it's torture porn. And I, to be I, fair, <laughs> to be fair, and nothing against the Saw movies, Seven is a way better movie made by a way better filmmaker. Oh yeah. So yeah, and it, yeah, I, I so. It, it, and, it's uh, better for me, but James Wan is no hack. And, and, well, I, I know. Well, this was yeah. also early James Wan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's early, early, uh, which really early. Is Lee uh, Lee Winnell's is uh, 2020. Like I think his uh, Invisible Man was my favorite movie of 2020. Period. And it, and it got the attention that it set out to get. And but I also think if you took the violence out of Saul, one, it would still work uh, because it was a intriguing story it was an intriguing scenario um but i remember being turned off by the violence and i also remember that the twist ending kind of felt like bullshit to me when i first saw the movie so i, I don't know uh it's almost midnight i guess we need yeah <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, we almost, could probably go on for hours yeah it's, it's, it's almost martin luther king day Yep, I got to go get a new battery tomorrow, so I'm excited. I gotta go take care of my car. Yeah, you got to get a different car. <laughs> oh, good luck with that, man. Enjoy the insurance company, I guess. Yeah. Well, I wonder if it'll be totaled. I think it will be. <laughs> like, we I was like, when you showed the pictures, like Jesus, you, are you missing any limbs? That was my first thought. <laughs> I'm very lucky that not a I didn't get killed and. Be that I'm not crippled or in, in a hospital right now. Yeah. Uh, so seatbelts work. So again, I got a band aid on my pinky. Oh man. <laughs> Do they have to airlift you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're okay. Yeah. Because I saw that picture, I feared for the worst. Whew. Well, let, thanks for bringing up the subject. It was fun just talking about old movies and stuff and stuff that, you know, that you love and. I get to share a few things as well. I'm really looking forward to hearing Seth and uh, Jared's uh, lists also, and then of course doing mine at some point. Yeah. Um, anybody I'll... who watches, we'll be we'll do Red State at some point, maybe next time, and some some rec movies. Seth's gonna make me watch them. Um, I may as well. I've got that four pack, uh, the Blu-rays. So, but uh, anything else you wanna say before we go, Nate? No. I need to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. It's only 10 for 11 for me, but still <laughs> had a long day. All right. Have a great night, Nate. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. The yep. horse and a kit discourse. Goodbye.